Mr. President, is there a privileged report at the desk? Senator Kunis, yes, there is. The secretary will read the report. Senator Diedzik from the Subcommittee on Conference Committees recommends that the following senators be, and they hereby are, appointed as a conference committee on Senate File Number 1955. Senators Putnam, Kupik, and Westrom. Senator Diedzik moves the following the foregoing appointments be approved. To that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members remaining under the order of business of motions and resolutions, um, I am going to call on Senator Akunas to articulate the uh, special orders. Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills to be made special orders for immediate consideration. And members, the list is at your desk. Members, Senator Kunish is correct. There is a special orders list at your desk that's dated April 21st, 2023. Uh, we will start with uh, number 23 on general orders, and that is House File 16, Senator Dibble, conver uh, a conversion therapy prohibition establishment. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to move that the amendment made to House File number 16 by the Committee on Rules and Administration in the report adopted February 27th, 2023, pursuant to Rule 45, be stricken. Member Senator Dibble moves that the amendment made to House File Number 16 by the Committee on Rules and, and Administration in the report adopted February 27th, 2023, pursuant to Rule 20, uh, excuse me, pursuant to Rule 45, be stricken. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Uh, so what we have in front of us is House File 16 with the language as adopted by the House. I will describe the differences uh, between the House and the Senate versions momentarily. Um, but I just wanted to first, uh, Mr. President, just talk a little bit about uh, what this bill hopes to achieve uh, and what it accomplishes. Put most simply, uh, Mr. President, members, this would ban the practice of coercing young people into conversion therapy by licensed practitioners. Therapy is a generous term in this context. It is a treatment, not really even a treatment, a practice, because it's not actually health care, that is not only ineffective but harmful. It has long been discredited and denounced by responsible and credible practitioners of medical and mental health care. And members, I will call your attention to a handout that has, I haven't even counted, but uh, probably approaching 20 professional health care associations and health providers um, with very, very strong statements denouncing the delivery of this so-called treatment. But I will say quickly that the American Academy of Pediat Pediatrics says therapy directed at specifically changing sexual orientation is contraindicated since it can provoke guilt and anxiety while having little or no potential for achieving changes in orientation. The American Psychiatric Association opposes any psychiatric treatment such as reparative or conversion therapy which is based on the assumption that homosexuality per se is a mental disorder or based on the a priori assumption that a patient should change his or her orientation or identity. The American Psychological Association concludes that there is insufficient evidence to support the use of psychological interventions, and on and on it goes. Mr. President, members, conversion therapy includes an array of practices that seek to persuade or induce an individual into believing their sexual orientation or gender identity can be changed. This is shown to be impossible. The true effect is to communicate to that person that they are disordered. Who they are is wrong. It is sinful. Mr. President, this has only the effect of causing damage in the form of depression, decreased self-esteem, substance abuse, self-harm, and in the worst case, suicide. Mr. President, this industry preys on people's fears and does irreparable harm to young people. The bill also seeks to prevent parents from being misled and deceived by the agents of the conversion therapy industry. I want to be clear, members, 
the question might come up. This does not reach into religious practice or belief or any form of practice or prayer in that realm. The restrictions apply only to paid professional services. Mr. President, we stand with a wide number of other states and jurisdictions, 20 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and 75 cities, including a number of cities here in Minnesota, have taken this step to protect their young people. In July of 2021, Governor Walz signed an executive order in, attempt, in an attempt to curtail the practice, but members, as we know, and the reason we're here today on the floor of the Senate, is that executive orders are limited in their reach and they expire. So members, the time is long past when we should be affirming to all people, all Minnesotans, including our LGBTQIA people, as perfect as they are, welcome to show up wherever they are wanted, wherever they are needed, as good, as fully human, bringing the entirety of their talents to every endeavor. We would all be richer for that, Mr. President. To the bill itself, the language that was added, if members are looking at House File 16 as transmitted to the Senate, the language in the first paragraph, which defines the client uh, and the client vis-a-vis -vis their relationship to their mental health practitioner or professional, and the nature of that professional relationship is the language that was added uh, to House File 16. There's some uh, additional technical language that refers to practice or treatment on line 19 um, and uh, defining the vulnerable adult for whom uh, this practice is uh, prohibited as a, as a client who is a vulnerable adult, likewise on 2.5 and 2.7. Uh, the bill prohibits conversion therapy services for by licensed practitioners to those who are under 18, as well as those who are vulnerable adults. It prohibits the payment of this so-called therapy, I refer to it as torture, uh, by medical assistance, Medicaid, Minnesota Medicaid, and as I said, as I said earlier, it prohibits false advertising uh, in this realm so that these services can't be construed as uh, effective uh, or make any false promises. With that, Mr. President, I stand for questions, discussion, or amendments. Any discussion on House File Number 16? Senator Uckey. Thank you, Mr. President, and I would just like to address the bill um, quickly, uh, and then we will, I think, have an amendment or two to, to discuss amongst uh, members. But uh, members, vulnerable adults and children deserve protection from harm, harmful practices, but this bill doesn't deliver. There are serious concerns this bill would make it harder for young people who want to have conversations with trusted adults in their lives. This goes beyond regulating a specific action and instead could lead to lawsuits regarding the First Amendment. We all agree children and vulnerable adults should be protected from this mistreatment and deplorable therapy practices, but this proposal goes beyond that. Conversion therapy is not a common practice and isn't covered by any insurance provider in this state. Unfortunately, this bill's vague language and expansive definitions could chill conversations with counselors for children who want to have wide-ranging conversations. Putting regulated counselors in a spot where they are limited from having the kind of dynamic conversations a child needs means a child will get inadequate support from their counselors. This is especially bad for minors and vulnerable adults because those initial conversations are sometimes the most important ones a young person could have as they go through their own personal journeys. So with that, members, I look forward to the conversations ahead. And uh, Mr. President, I think we'll have uh, some amendment or two for you. All right, um, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would the bill author yield for a question? Uh, Senator uh, Dibble will yield, uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, my question is, are you concerned that 
any aspect of the legislation that's before the body could be found unconstitutional in a Minnesota or in a federal court? Or are you satisfied that there, there won't be any constitutional issues if this bill gets passed into law? Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Rasmussen. It's an excellent question. Uh, and I'm glad you've asked it so that we can state clearly and unequivocally on the floor of the Senate here. Um, there is no element of this bill um, that is unconstitutional. In fact, uh, um, uh, this similar legislation has been tested in courts of other jurisdictions and has been upheld. Thank you. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and I appreciate that, Senator Dibble. And th then I, th I think I have a, an amendment that I hope will be able to be a friendly amendment. And so at this time, Mr. President, I would offer the A-1. Senator Rasmussen offers the A-1 amendment. The Secretary will report the A-1 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves to amend House File Number 16 as follows, page 2 after line 28, insert. This is the A-1 amendment. Senator Rasmussen, to your A-1 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. The A-1 amendment is a fairly simple amendment. It simply adds non-severability into the bill. And so that simply means, Mr. President, members, that if any part of this bill um, gets struck down by a court, is found to be unconstitutional, that the entire law will be found unconstitutional, or that the entire law will fall away. And the reason to have language like this, Mr. President and members, is that it is our job as a legislature to write the laws, and we don't want courts rewriting this law if there are constitutional issues. Um, it sounds like the bill's author is confident that there won't be, and so I think this would be a good amendment uh, to adopt onto the bill. Um, I have some questions and concerns that this bill may have uh, legal issues in the court. Um, a similar ban that did not include vulnerable adults or a consumer fraud provision um, as expansive as what is proposed was found unconstitutional in, in federal court in the Eighth Circuit. Um, I also have concerns that when we look at subdivision seven under um, uh, section two of the bill, the advertisement and sales piece, that this could effectively ban books or speakers with messages about reconciling one's biological sex in certain contexts. And so I think there will be um, some constitutional issues with that. And because of that, Mr. President, I would ask that members support the A-1 amendment to make sure that courts don't rewrite this bill. And if there are issues, that we can come back to the legislature and work those out. Senator uh, Dibble, to the A-1 amendment. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, so I'll, I'll respond first. First, uh, members, I will ask that uh, we vote no on the A-1. I'll request a roll call vote. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I first wanted to respond to Senator Rasmussen's um, concern that uh, books and speeches and other forms of speech about uh, conversion therapy and its uh, um, desirability on this, uh, that some people feel it might have uh, would be somehow constrained. Um, that is not the case, um, that this is uh, narrowly tailored to uh, conducting trade or commerce, uh, to not use or employ any fraud, false pretense, false promise, false guarantee, misrepresentation, uh, false or misleading statement, deceptive practice by advertising or otherwise offering conversion therapy services. Um, so write all the books you want, knock yourself out, give speeches, preach from the pulpit, talk about uh, how much you love conversion therapy. I refer to as torture. You're free to do that as an American citizen exercising your speech and religious rights. Um, however, um, to the bill itself, I don't understand why um, we would um, uh, tie all elements of the bill together. Senator Rasmussen talked about a, a finding in a court. Um, so there is one instance it's uh, thought widely panned uh, by legal scholars and analysts as to be uh, an outlier um, and is likely going to be overturned uh, in short order. But there are literally dozens of other uh, cases that uphold uh, one or more elements of this bill. Um, and so this would simply, um, you know, heaven forfend, uh, should I be wrong and Senator Rasmussen be right uh, about subdivision seven. Um, that means that the ability to protect young people from this form of torture would also be made moot by this amendment. So I would vote, ask for a no vote. Thank you. Senator, any other senators have any comments before we go to the author for his last comment, if he has any? Senator Putnam. 
Thank you, Mr. President. While I appreciate the spirit of the amendment, uh, I do think it's appropriate because it calculates some sort of metric of likelihood that there is no significant First Amendment issue here at all whatsoever. What we're talking about is commercial speech in 1942 in Valentine versus Christensen. Uh, it was declared that commercial speech does not have First Amendment protection, but more importantly, a couple years later, 1980, in uh, Central Hudson uh, versus I can't remember, uh, there was a, a pretty clear decision that in certain circumstances the government does have a compelling right to shape commercial speech. There is no significant uh, First Amendment risk here, and so because of the absence of risk and likelihood, the amendment is not necessary. Any other uh, discussion before we go to this, the amendment author? Seeing none, Senator Rasmussen, do you have any final comments before we vote? Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate the discussion on this today. And you know, given the certainty that um, my Democrat colleagues have on there being no issues, I think the A1 amendment makes sense to adopt. Again, I don't think we should let courts and judges write laws as important as this one here in the state of Minnesota. Um, and my concerns go back to, again, subdivision seven, which I read as pretty broad. And from my research there, it would be the broadest uh, law like this in the country, where it says on page two, line 23, no person or entity shall. And so it's not just focused on uh, licensed medical professionals who would be providing therapy services. It is talking about any person or any entity um, that uh, could be engaging in speech. And it's important, Mr. President and members, to understand the First Amendment is there to protect uh, speech that government disagrees with, that maybe many of us in this room disagree with, and that's why we have our First Amendment rights. Um, I believe there'll be some issues with this bill as, as drafted, and so I think it's important for the legislature to do this important work and not let the courts do it. The Secretary will give the A1 Amendment, excuse me, the Secretary will, will, will take the role on the A1 Amendment. Senator Friends, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Mann votes no. Senator Mann votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 27 ayes and 34 noes. The A1 amendment is not adopted. Any additional amendments on, on, on House File 16? Seeing none, the secretary will give House File 16 its third reading. House file number 16, a bill for an act relating to health, prohibiting conversion therapy with children or vulnerable adults. Any other uh, discussion on House file 16? Uh, Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President and members. And um, this bill is not new to us. And Senator Dibble and I have had some discussions at the committee level. And 
I just have some easy questions. He's heard all of them before, just to make sure people understand um, what the bill does and what it doesn't do. Um, and I am um, personally uh, compelled at the, uh, the pain many people have felt in the past um, with some of the therapies that they have experienced, and some indeed were, were like torturous and probably <clears throat> illegal now, or they should have been back then. Um, one of the first discussions I had was with some um, young adults in the hallway, and they had said that there's waterboarding and electroshock therapy going on. And I said, really, tell me, this was several years ago. I said, well, tell me about that. Where's the list of places? And I looked at the 30 places on the list, and I actually knew some of those folks. And so I said, uh, I was surprised about that, so I actually called a couple of them up, and I said, do you guys do waterboarding and, and electroshock therapy? And they go like, well, no, we never, ever have done that here. And so um, th that was kind of really good to hear. So I'm just going to ask Senator Dibble two easy questions uh, on that. Um, if, if he would yield, Mr. President. Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Abler. Okay, thank you. And it's just the softest of softballs. Uh, Senator Dibble, are you aware of any waterboarding or shock therapy going on these days in the name of conversion therapy? Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Abel, thank you for, um, for asking specifically about uh, the nature of conversion therapy. Um, I'll expand on my response later. Um, I am aware uh, and, and know people who have experienced uh, coercive physical practices, um, nothing like waterboarding. Um, and uh, and I, I do know people who have received electroshock therapy because they've been diagnosed with other forms of, of mental illness for which at one point related to uh, being LGBTQ uh, and in error. Um, but shock therapy of which the type that you describe um, uh, I've not heard of, but um, I have definitely aware of other forms of physically coercive practices. That, however, is rare. I'll get into that more about the nature and the harm of conversion therapy as we understand it today. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator well, Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I, I appreciate that, and that's the answer I expected. And, and, and part of it just points out that there's been some talk about some of these practices that simply are not true. Um, and I will just repeat again that uh, I don't think any of us would stand for such. I don't think any of us would stand for any physically aversive practices or anything of that sort. In this day and age, uh, and I would imagine for some time going into the past, and I do know for a fact that none of the people on that list that I talked to had ever even thought about that as an idea. And it just made me a little disappointed that when I went back to them, I said, by the way, I checked with, they came back, and I said, by the way, I checked with some of these, these, uh, these counselor folks, um, psychologists, et cetera, and they go like, well, yeah, that isn't really going on. But they were saying it was as part of marketing for this, and I just thought that was unnecessary. Um, and the, uh, the places I'm aware of uh, aren't the least bit harsh on anybody, and they have conversations. And uh, to my understanding, the people go there because they would like to be having a discussion. And, um, and so just want to clarify, Senator Dibble, if he would yield again, Mr. President. Senator Abler, I'm sorry, did oh, you have a Senator question? Senator Dibble would yield again, Mr. President. Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Abler. Okay, and at the, at the committee, Senator Dibble, um, when we heard this, there were a couple of ministers that came up and uh, one expressed a concern that she would not be able to uh, have classes at the church that she had on topics including this and many other topics, but this might come up from time to time. And another person actually uh, did some speaking, not just on this topic, but this topic may be touched on uh, in some of his conversations. And uh, so, Senator Dibble, is it your opinion that I think I know what you're going to say, that, that these folks can still have their classes and touch on these matters as they come up in a natural way, uh, either in uh, part of a church sermon or part of a church class or part of a lecture or even if a person writes a book. Um, this doesn't change any of that. Is that right? Uh, uh, Senator, Senator Dibble. Dibble, to the question. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Abler, you're correct. Um, this bill in no way reaches into uh, constitutionally protected exercise of uh, religion, the freedom of religion, uh, what anyone would choose to speak of in their capacity uh, as a religious leader. Um, you know, uh, if you know, some ministers, of course, are licensed mental health therapists. If they're, you know, sitting in their uh, mental health therapy office as a licensed uh, practitioner, of, that they would be constrained. But as a religious leader um, in their own congregation, um, they're free to talk about anything they so choose. Thank you. Senator Aver. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and Senator Dibble, thank you for clarifying those. Those are my softball questions for you. And, you know, I just want to say from, from my point of view, as I listen to Senator Dibble and some others who have had, you know, in the past have had legitimately challenging conversations that, um, that didn't go as well as I think they may be going now, um, that I'm really sorry and sad about that, and I'm not neglectful of that on this topic. And I think it's important to recognize that particularly in times gone by, that there have been some things happening that we all should really uh, be sorrowful about. Uh, if you look at, uh, just, I'll just leave it at that. And, and so um, this, and Mr. President, I think this bill might have made a lot of sense uh, 20 years ago. Um, and, but I'm, the concern I express is that, uh, uh, I've been doing a lot of reading, Mr. President, on this topic, researching quite a bit, looking at what's going on in Sweden and the Netherlands and Finland, um, and uh, with some of the um, consequences that go forward, which um, we may discuss on the other bill. I don't even want to spend too much time getting in the weeds, but there, it, it is this issue with the, with the people, with the trans discussions and the, the gender uh, issues that come up. Um, I read one place, I'll just say it now, I guess, that, then I can be done for the day on these topics. Um, one place, uh, one person said trans is fun, uh, and another place was saying it's just kind of, um, and then that was the idea, it's like just kind of fun. And I don't think it's fun, I think that's unfair to make it as simple as that and frankly as you read some of the international research if you go back 20 years there's some people like Sweden and Finland have done some some research and in fact even with some of the treatments that we're going to be talking about today there's some very ill effects uh, suicides 20 times the regular population and um, and so on and um, it's not casual and and it's not something to be disregarded and to be treated in a, in a, a manner where you would uh, make anybody feel different for how they're working through all that or even what they're choosing. And I don't think anybody on this floor feels like that, Mr. President. But I, I just think on this bill, it's too bad that we're gonna close the door on a chance for somebody to go and just have a calm chat with somebody that they trust and bar that from them when it might actually just help them through one more day or one more challenge, and then they can still choose what they want to do. Um, so, Mr. President, just in short, um, I am so respectful of the debate and so interested in the people that are behind this and what has gone on before and compared to what's going on now that I'm afraid that we're barring something that's actually very productive or could be productive in the choice of the person who would choose to choose that um, with an, you know, open hands. And so um, that's why I'll be voting no. But it's not for any other reasons than I just don't want to close the door on quality help and even discussions and dialogue um, that might be productive. So thank, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Dibble, for your answers. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I can't imagine calling this practice anything other than torture. This is, to me, not therapy. I, my entire adult life, have volunteered with children, um, working at a women's shelter and working with some of the children there at a homeless shelter, and then a lot of work with abused, neglected children currently also being a foster parent. 
And what I know is that children come from different experiences, they are wired differently, and you have to let them be authentic to who they are if they are going to thrive. And even as a parent now, I have, uh, because I recently adopted my foster son, I have two six-year-olds, they're a month apart, and they're just wired differently. One loves art and would sit all day and, and color and makes amazing drawings if you let them, let him. Um, the other one will sit and ask me math problems already all day long. They're just wired differently. And if I forced my son, who loves math, to be an artist, he would be miserable, and vice versa. And I see this the same way. If at your core, you have whatever orientation that you are meant to have, that is the authentic self we should embrace and love. Because it appear, as a parent, at the end of the day, here is how I see my job. To love the heck out of my kids so that they know they have a safe place as children and through life. To make sure that they are kind. To make sure they have the tools they need to go be a productive, happy adult someday. But my job is not to change the core of who they are. Because just like if I force the child who loves math to do art, he would be miserable. So are kids who are asked to change their orientation. There have been cases of people forced into this, whether it's physical or just emotional, torture of conversion therapy. There was a girl in Ohio who literally had so little support and after going through this, walked in front of a tractor and killed herself, leaving a suicide note saying, people shouldn't be treated the way she was. That's where the suicide comes from. It is the lack of compassion and the lack of letting people be who they authentically are. So I will continue to love everyone in all their beautiful, glorious differences and not try to change them. And I encourage others to act with that same love and compassion and vote for this bill today. Senator Grunhagen. I think it's fixed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I, um, I just thought I'd share a couple things. I know this is a deeply emotional and a lot of uh, strongly held beliefs on this particular issue, okay? And, uh, you know, I've shared with you some of the things I've done in my own life, and I know everyone here cares and loves about people, especially the children, or they wouldn't be here, in my opinion. And uh, so I'm not trying to doubt that in any way. But based on my experience, I do have uh, homosexual friends, and I've got former homosexual friends. And in fact, the first bill I ever got through the House and the Senate, and Governor Dayton signed, I had a homosexual lobbyist assigned to me. We're still friends. Now, he moved out of state, but it's interesting just this session, I ran into him down in the lunchroom, and he came, I didn't see him, but he came right over to my table, and we uh, had a chance to visit some. And he's still, in fact, uh, according to the information I have, he's married 
to another man, and uh, he seemed satisfied in that. And, uh, you know, we're still friends, e even though him and I have uh, differed on a couple of issues in that area. Second thing is, my former homosexual uh, friend, the one I got real close to, was uh, somebody who had been very active in the gay lifestyle for about 10 years here in Minnesota, down on Lake Street, and suddenly he became very depressed and suicidal in what he was doing, and he wanted help. So he went to a Catholic uh, uh, counseling service and there he got the help he needed, and he did get married and uh, had three children, wonderful children. And he decided that on his own. So, um, you know, I, my concern about this bill is that a person like uh, my former friend, again, was active 10 years in the gay lifestyle, but then became very depressed and even suicidal, and he went and got counseling. Now he's married and has three children, and he's extremely happy about that, or satisfied. And I still hear from him from time to time. So, Mr. President, if uh, Senator Dibble would yield for question. Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Grudenhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Senator Dibble. My question is, my, you know, my friend who's a former homosexual was deeply depressed. He wanted help to change his lifestyle. And yet the way I read this bill, and even the part about advertisement, is he could not get that help in the state of Minnesota. Is that correct? Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Grunhagen. Um, appreciate the question because it gives an opportunity to clarify what the bill does and doesn't do. Uh, so uh, the, the person you're describing um, was, is an adult uh, and has uh, exercised their freedom and agency autonomy to do as they see fit, sought out religious counseling and therapy and uh, moved on with uh, his life as he saw fit. This bill would not affect his ability to do that in any way. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President, Senator Dibble. I, I uh, read a little bit different, but uh, appreciate that response. Um, the other thing that seems uh, a little bit contradictory to me is that when we talked about the abortion bill, we talked about the sacred relationship between a doctor and his patient, and government should not get involved in that relationship in any way. And yet when I read this bill, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are going, uh, you know, 180 degrees different than that on this particular issue. So, you know, if Senator Dibble would uh, yield for a question. Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will yield. Uh, Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Yeah, so Senator DeDevil, do you consider the doctor-patient relationship uh, sacred and that government shouldn't, shouldn't insert itself into that relationship? Senator DeDevil, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, what I see uh, is that question here is others with, uh, with a different uh, kind of pseudo-scientific, uh, religious, or some other agenda inserting themselves into these relationships and parading as uh, providing health care when in fact uh, conversion therapy isn't therapy, it's not health care, it's malpractice uh, and there is no uh, evidence uh, that, that uh, supports its effectiveness and there is a tremendous amount of evidence um, as, and Senator Grunhagen, please take a look at this handout um, that has the statements of, of you know, fully 20 uh, professional healthcare medical organizations, child uh, and adolescent psychiatry, pediatrics, marriage and family therapy, College of Physicians, American Counseling Association, American Medical Association, uh, Psychiatric Association, Psychoanalytic Association, Psychological Association, counselors, uh, health, uh, American Public Health 
school health, social workers, and on it goes, uh, Senator Goonhagen, where each of these organizations says, this is a practice that constitutes malpractice, does active harm in people's lives. It is in the public's interest to protect young people who have no agency, no autonomy, no legal standing of their own uh, uh, to, be, to be protected from these kinds of harms. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Grudhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, thanks for that response, Senator Dibble. Yeah, you know, in uh, last year in the other body, I was on the committee where this same bill came forward. And we had uh, numerous uh, former lesbians, uh, gays, and even young people uh, come out and testify against it because they wanted, now we had plenty that, you know, it was kind of even. We had probably 30, 40 testifiers, and there were young on both sides. Uh, there were lesbians and gays who testified for it. There were former lesbians and former gays that testified against it. And uh, I just think what we're doing here is gagging uh, a counselor, a licensed counselor, medical counselor, for people who want to seek help. In fact, uh, some of the former lesbians and gays actually shared that when they changed from what they were doing to uh, where they were at now, there was no uh, electric uh, shock or things like I think maybe some of that happened in the past, but I don't think it's present today, at least from the testimony we had. And we had medical doctors and therapists testify against this bill. They just want the freedom to be able to respond to their, to their patient that comes to them in love and understanding without government interference. So members, please vote red on this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Seberger. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for this important bill. And to all the LGBTQIA plus youth out there, you are perfect the way you are. And I will gladly be voting yes. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President. If you'll indulge me just for a moment in a, an analogy that I think speaks to some of the concerns that Senator Grunhagen raised. Uh, 30 pounds ago, I was a pretty good basketball player. All right, maybe 40. I was a pretty good basketball player. But I'm 5'11 and a half. I like to say 5'12. But uh, that meant I couldn't quite dunk. But I always wanted to dunk. I used to get really close, but I couldn't quite dunk. Now, some came along and said, hey, Eric, uh, if you pay me, I can talk you into being taller. I would have paid that bill in a heartbeat. Uh, because I wanted to be different. I wanted to be something else. Now, as challenging as that was for me at some point, obviously it wasn't hugely emotional, but I always still wanted to dunk. At some point, I had to acknowledge that I wasn't going to be able to dunk. Now, imagine how much more difficult that would have been if everyone in my community and my world expected me to dunk or wanted me to dunk or judged me for not dunking. My example might seem superfluous or silly or inappropriate, but it does, I think, illustrate a greater point, not just about this bill, but how, about how we all need to answer a call to greater humility, to understand that we don't have all the answers, that other people don't have to be like us to be worthy of basic dignity, basic respect, and just as important, to be left the hell alone. Members, not just with this issue, but with the work that we do, if we could only embrace that fundamental call to humility, to understanding that we don't have the answers and we don't have to change other people and we don't have to change the world to make it look like how we want it to look. People aren't objects, they're human beings with basic fundamental dignity, deserving of our love, respect, and sometimes our indifference to let them do whatever they wanna do. So members, I am grateful to Senator Dibble for bringing this bill forward and I'm eager to vote on its behalf. Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. President, good morning. Senator Dibble has been bringing this forward since I've been in the Senate. We've had m numerous votes on this. I, I remember them well. And I'm sure he was working on it before I was in the Senate. Uh, and his courage and persistence in bringing it forward is an example uh, and, and uh, an inspiration to me. I want to say just a few words to the young people in Minnesota who have been victimized by this in the past and those who won't be victimized it in the future after Governor Walls signs this bill, you are worthy, you are good, 
If you have been ashamed when you have done nothing wrong, if you have tried to hide your instincts when your instincts told you to love, if you have been ridiculed when you only lived your truth, good morning. Good morning. We in the Minnesota Senate welcome you. We love you. We will be with you. Minnesota is your home. Live your truth. Love who you love. Walk with your head held high. You are perfect. You are beautiful. You make us better. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President and members. About 10 years ago was when I first got involved in politics in Minnesota, and it was around the marriage equality movement. And through my volunteering with that movement and getting to know folks from my community and from around the state, I really um, saw the power of sharing our true stories and what that means for moving our communities, for opening hearts and minds, for bringing tolerance and an incredible amount of joy into the world. And, you know, I spent a lot of time up here that year uh, as a volunteer and as an organizer, and the Capitol was always a buzz with energy and with the, the light that comes from people being their full true selves and fighting for their own human rights. And today walking in and hearing that same joy buzzing in our capital and knowing that today we are, we're going to pass a bill that's going to say loudly to our, our LGBTQ youth that they, this is their house too. This is the people's house, and that includes us all, and we will protect us all. Senator Dibble has been working on this bill since that time a decade ago when I was here. Uh, I am incredibly honored and filled with joy to be able to press the screen button today. I encourage all members to join us. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Since the beginning of time, there have been many different perspectives on behaviors, choices, by many different people, guided by many different books of faith, influences of culture, and organizations of their day. And there are many opinions. There are many opinions, again, that are guided by faith or not faith. I happen to have, in my immediate family, multiple religious faiths with different perspectives on different topics. I'm very concerned with provisions in this bill that seek to discriminate against religious liberty and licensed professionals that seek to practice their faith in their profession, and specifically on the topics of sexual orientation and gender identity. Gender confusion is on the rise. More than ever before, young people are struggling to understand personal identity. Again, this bill seeks to violate the freedom of speech of persons of faith acting in a professional licensed capacity in private settings. This bill seeks to discriminate against certain viewpoints 
of sexual identity and gender identity. This bill seeks to prohibit young people and vulnerable adults struggling with sexual identity or gender identity from seeking the help of licensed mental health counselors who are guided by their faith beliefs. Despite the many perspectives guided by different people, organizations, religious faiths, and more, this bill seeks to codify one set of beliefs. And it would make it illegal to stray from the single perspective of the majority in this body in this moment of time. And just because the majority of 67 people in this body votes on something that might pass doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it true. Codifying the majority of 67 people into Minnesota statute doesn't make it true. And as I'm thinking about this legislation before us, as I'm listening to the debates, as we're contemplating passing this into statute, I think of another story from the annals of history, from truth, recorded for us by a man named Daniel. Daniel lived in a time, in a period, where his religious liberties were under attack. And the professionals in his day petitioned the leader in that system to make his religious viewpoints and faith illegal. And they were successful. And the punishment for violating the law was he was cast into a den of lions because he sought to stand fast for his beliefs. He was not going to allow the professionals in his day with their titles to coerce him into violating his deeply held, sincerely held beliefs. And the legal system in that day, again, the punishment was to be thrown into a den of lions. There are many people in our day that have titles that are called professionals and are petitioning officials in our government in our day, but again, that doesn't make their viewpoint true, despite their title, Passing specific language by this body doesn't make it true. And there are many in our day that will hold fast to their sincerely held religious beliefs. And they will not allow themselves to be influenced or coerced into violations of those beliefs. And I'm very concerned, Mr. President and members, that this language is bringing us down the same path that others have gone down in history. And this is the continuation of a road that is not going to change the hearts of those who seek to, with compassion, with love, help young people 
I'm very concerned, Mr. President. There are ways that we can help our young people, and we should do so, with compassion and love. Truth in love should always be the objective. That is the way that I operate. It is the way that many operate. And it is what we should be doing in this body, Mr. President. And for those reasons, I would encourage a no vote on this legislation. Thank you. Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, members. I'll be a yes vote on this bill. And I hope there's one thing we all agree on here. We are here for Minnesotans, and the Minnesotans that I seem to get along the best with are builders and includers, and we are building and including today. Who are the people affected by Senator Dibble's bill, who I have praise for, but I'll get to that in a moment? They're Minnesotans. They're just as Minnesotan as the rest of us, no more and no less, and we're here to work for all Minnesotans. Why? Because we're stronger. Look around the chamber at the members who build and include working relationships with other members. They are the successful ones. Look at the members that say, what's your perspective? I'm interested in that. Tell me more about how you feel. Respect, exchange, and then legislate. That's what the people want us to do. This piece of legislation says no less than this group of Minnesotans is a part of our state, a part of our culture, and a part of our family. And I would urge members to vote yes on Senator Dibble's bill so that you can build and include working relationships with those Minnesotans because let me tell you, the young people of Minnesota are asking you to do that. The advocates who want this bill are saying vote yes on this bill. It harms no one to stick up for other Minnesotans and what it does in fact is engage with other Minnesotans and tell them that agree or disagree we're all in this together. And I would suggest to you that not only does that lead you to a yes vote on this bill, but it leads you to compromise, teamwork, and all the other good things Minnesotans want us to do in all the rest of our work here in the last month. Now for my good friend, the Senator from Minneapolis. Thank you. Your work here is epic. And we come here thinking we're going to do great things, and you're doing a great one today. And this straight white male will see you at the Southern Minnesota Pride Parade along with all our friends this year. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Yes vote on this bill. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Senator Dibble, for letting me be on this bill. It was a true honor. Um, I had to fight to be the fifth one. <laughs> and... Um, I'm just so proud to be on it. I think of my own family. I have four kids, all raised Roman Catholic. We continue to be a Catholic family. Two of them are gay. They were raised exactly the same as my other two. I love them. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to think that they might have hesitated to tell me that because of religion. So we heard a lot about truth and religion. Religion is about love. It's not about hate. It's about loving humanity. That's what's true. It's true that two of my kids are and two of my kids aren't, but I love them so much. I'm so proud of them. I want everybody to know the kids are watching us. They might not be watching right now, but they're watching and they'll watch this later. Some of the issues they know more about than any of us in here. They might not be following our day-to-day -day policies, but there are some issues that they're watching pretty closely. This is one of them. This is a big one for them. So for any of them watching today, or who's going to watch later, this is for all the kids who are all the way in Shakopee, or Chaska, Hugo, Blaine, Stillwater, everybody from the Iron Range down to Albert Lee. We are standing up for you today. I'm going to say to you what I would say to my own kids who are in LGBTQ community. You are good and perfect just the way you are. I'm going to stand up for you today. I'm going to protect you with everything I have. You matter. Your voice matters. Your happiness matters. There is nothing wrong with you. You belong here. And to my own kids, who I know are watching today, I love you. This vote's for you. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to get the focus back on the bill.
before us, uh, and I would ask uh, if Senator uh, or the author would yield. Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble, um, as I look at the bill on the back page, page two, um, I noticed that this bill, even in its Senate version, did not come through the Judiciary Committee. So I had a question. Um, is there a liability in the event that someone violates this new law, uh, financial uh, liability? Could they be sued? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Limmer, if you look at paragraph B on uh, line uh, 2.6, um, the uh, professional who uh, would violate the uh, terms of this law uh, would be subject uh, to professional disciplinary action by the licensing board of the mental health practitioner or the mental health professional. Senator Limmer. So, Mr. Chair, or Mr. President, uh, Senator Dibble, I would imagine there's a variety of staged sanctions that could be triggered in the event that a mental health practitioner or a mental health professional, uh, if they so violated this uh, prohibition, uh, could be subject to, including all the way up to having their license uh, permanently taken away. Is that correct? Senator uh, Limmer, are you asking him to yield uh, for another question? I'm sorry, yes, uh, Mr. President. No. Uh, Senator Dibble, will you yield? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, that would be a matter for those licensing boards to determine for themselves. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer. But, Mr. President, um, the question I'm asking Senator Dibble is the ultimate sanction could be the uh, removal of someone's license and the ability to practice their profession. Is that correct? Are you asking them to yield again, Senator Limmer? Uh, yes, Ms. President. Senator, Lim uh, uh, Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will. Uh, to thank the you. question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer, I will just uh, refer you to the language of the bill, uh, and you can construe it any way you so desire. Uh, it says that uh, unprofessional conduct uh, may be subject uh, subject the mental health practitioner or mental health professional to disciplinary action by the licensing board of the mental health practitioner or mental health professional. Um, the, the phone numbers and the email addresses, contact information for those licensing boards is publicly available, and I would invite you to make that inquiry, this inquiry of them. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Limmer. Mr. President, um, I'm not familiar with licensing boards of the mental health practitioners or mental health professional. I figured that the author would probably know the potential sanctions if this was violated. Um, so I guess I will have to follow up with a phone number, uh, but uh, I won't have that information prior to vote. Um, you know, if this would have been in the Judiciary Committee, we would have asked perhaps some hypothetical questions just to get a little bit more understanding. And I, I have one or maybe two that I would ask Senator Dibble to yield. Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble, um, if a young person under 18 years of age was starting to have some concerns about what type of uh, sexual orientation they may have, and if they just casually asked someone who was licensed as a pr practitioner, do you have a book that I could maybe explore? Uh, I don't need an appointment, but could you point at a book? Would that be a violation from a mental health practitioner? I'm trying to get a, a scale of activity that might trigger an action, a disciplinary action by a licensing board. Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you. An excellent question. I appreciate the question, Senator Limmer. I will again refer you to the language of the bill. 
A client for the purpose of this section means a person requesting or receiving services from a mental health practitioner or mental health professional within the context of a relationship that a reasonable person would construe as a professional relationship. Senator, Senator Limmer. Uh, another question to yield, uh, Senator, or Senator, Senator Dibble, Dibble, will you yield? He will yield, Senator Limmer. So by that answer, Mr. President and Senator Dibble, uh, a casual request for a book would not be uh, crossing the line of that mental health practitioner or professional. Is that how I'm construing your answer? Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Limmer, again, I refer you to uh, uh, it, the language of the bill says a professional relationship uh, that a reasonable person would construe as a professional relationship. So I think the, the bill is quite clear, um, uh, and we know what a professional relationship is with a mental health practitioner or a mental health pro uh, professional. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer. Mr. President, I, I suppose we'll just have to let a court decide how far and when that line is crossed. It raises a few other questions down on the bottom of page two. Uh, anyone who uses or employs any false pretense or false promise or false guarantee, um, that too could be open for opinion. Uh, seems as though it would be a subjective decision by a court as well, and uh, raises questions on the objectivity of the bill. Thank you. Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. I am just so happy today. Um, I'm happy because I get to stand here as my full, beautiful, queer self. And I know that that really matters. I see that when young people come to my office and they get to see the pansexual flag that I proudly have hanging in my office. And they're excited and they want to take photos together. And they see someone making decisions who looks like them, who loves like them. Um, and it matters. And it matters because I get to co-author legislation like this that affirms us and that shows that we are completely perfect the way that we are. I'm also just so happy that I have a family that loves me and supports me for who I am, um, especially when that is so hard for our LGBTQ community to often find that love and support in our family, and we often have to find that in our chosen family. I know that I have so many colleagues here who love and support me for exactly who I am that my community does. Um, I have so much love for District 66 that said, we trust you, we know exactly who you are, and we want you to go to the Senate and make decisions for us. And today, I'm so happy because the state of Minnesota is saying, we love you. You belong here. This is your state. I urge you all to vote yes. Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Scott Dibble, for everything you do. There's a letter in here from the Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the president, and she says, conversion therapy can lead to poor self-esteem, self-harm, guilt, anxiety, depression, and suicide. Why would we even be debating anything that can possibly lead to poor self-esteem, self-harm, guilt, anxiety, depression, and suicide? I taught 12,000 students in my teaching career. And um, I don't know how many of them were gay or lesbian. But I do know this, in 2016, after my first election, I got a lot of letters and emails from former students, mostly congratulating me. And, um, but I'll never forget the one. And he said, um, thank you 
from making, I never came out when I was in high school, but I always felt safe in your classroom. You made being gay or lesbian an okay thing to be. And then his last sentence in his email was very funny, and he said, and that was before Ellen came out. And, and I want to thank Senator Aaron May Quaid for what we're about to discuss in a little while later. And I don't know how many of my students were in transition in my teaching career. I know that many of them were named Erica and preferred to be called Eric. And some of them were Johns and preferred to be called Joanna. I don't know how many of those I had, but I'll never, ever forget the first time in my class on the very first day of school when that young person walked up to me before the bell rang, before anybody came into class, high school sophomore, and they said, can I see your seating chart? And I said, well, yeah. Um, and I pointed to where this young person was sitting. And they saw the name that I took out of the course description, out, out of the course, um, the sil whatever, the seating, ch the, the list of students that you had. And that young person looked at me and said, I prefer to be called this. And I looked at them, high school, 15-year-old kid, September of their sophomore year. And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say because it was a new experience. I never had that situation happen to me before. But I'm grateful for that student for making me realize that they were normal, that they were a great kid, and for making me realize not every, all of us think the same way. And what our heads say sometimes doesn't match what our birth certificate says. And, um, but all I know is this. Any therapy that leads to poor self-esteem, self-harm, guilt, anxiety, depression, and suicide, we should never be even discussing this. So th I thank both senators for these wonderful bills we'll be debating today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Aki. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, like everyone, we're all concerned and care for these young people and vulnerable adults that this bill talks about. But it does bring forth a big concern over the freedom of speech, particularly for these professional counselors that might be uh, asked for services and they can't. So this brings up a big point. It does violate our First Amendment. Um, this bill would not allow a young person or a vulnerable adult that willingly wants counseling to be able to talk with that professional. That is a major failure of the bill and again, um, that's direct, hits right on our First Amendment. This bill only allows one outcome, and that isn't right. I firmly believe professional advice is the most desired form of advice that these people can and want to receive. This language has been challenged in a number of states uh, that have passed it, and the results show that this can and will be ruled unconstitutional. Plus, large financial payments have been awarded. So there are consequences to this that are going to affect all taxpayers. Data shows that some individuals in this situation have other underlying conditions and assistance in working through all concerns and issue, issues should be an appropriate approach. We all desire what is best for our young people, their parents or guardians, and our vulnerable adults. One size does not fit all. Please support choice for those that are looking for help in seeking a wide-ranging uh, number of conversations. This bill does not support choice, so I, I will not be supporting this bill. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Mr. President, 
10 years ago when the good senator from Minneapolis was talking about conversion therapy and the need to protect youth because they were not being a simple thing of being allowed to be their authentic self. And that same conversation of authentic self also came in, Mr. President, when we talked about the freedom to marry in the state of Minnesota. How can we assure that somebody's their authentic self? The same time 10 years ago, Pam Riddle and her husband, John, introduced me to a young child named Andrew. And then now, 10 years later, that young child, Andrew, is 15 years old and is a loving Andrea. And you know what's amazing about this? Is even at four and five years old, John and Pam knew that Andrea was waiting to come out of who that person's authentic self is. And today, the difference between why Andrea is a successful 15-year-old in a wonderful school district, which happens to be the largest school district in the state of Minnesota, Mr. President, I don't know if you knew that, but Andrea was surrounded by loving community, loving family, loving friends, loving parents who allowed her to be her authentic self. And it goes with what Brene Brown said, what we know matters, but what but who we are matters more. And with that, Brene Brown also said that you are worthy of love and belonging. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for bringing back this conversation 10 years later because we are worthy of love and belonging. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, members, for the discussion. Um, I think everybody in this chamber loves our state. I think everybody in this chamber loves all the kids in this state, regardless of their sexual orientation. I know I sure do. The question before us is what is the right approach for us to take in terms of, of this issue that uh, Senator Dibble brings up of uh, the questions around conversion therapy, is there conversion therapy going on in this state, et cetera. Um, if, uh, wondering if the author of the bill, I wanna get to the bill like, like Senator Limmer did. Um, Mr. President, wondering if the author would yield. Mr. President. Senator Dibble, will you yield? He will yield, Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble, is there, do, I mean, do we have concrete examples of conversion therapy happening in Minnesota? Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator uh, Dreskowski, absolutely we do. Um, uh, a, a number, uh, a few years ago, um, as we were first uh, starting uh, this process of pursuing this policy change. Uh, just within the Twin Cities, I think um, it was discovered uh, fully 16 uh, uh, licensed clinical settings uh, were offering uh, and, and providing conversion therapy. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's an excellent question. I'm very glad you asked it because some people find it hard to believe that such a uh, obviously uh, false uh, so-called therapy based on junk science that does real damage to people could possibly uh, be happening in today's day and age, but it absolutely is. And of course, Mr. President, we had many, many young people come forward and talk about their own experiences being subjected to conversion therapy in the form of testimony in committee hearings. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, well, I haven't you know, I haven't seen it myself or had anybody bring that up to me. Uh, so um, it sounds like maybe there were some examples from before. I'm, I'm curious, Mr. President, if, if there are still examples today. Uh, evidently, Senator Dibble would say there are. Um, another question I have about the bill, Senator Dibble, um, on lines 1.17 and 1.18 of the bill, the language reads, including efforts to change behaviors or gender expression or to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings toward individuals 
of the same gender. So my question to you is, um, does this mean that um, the conversion therapy would be legal under your bill for uh, people who uh, attempted to change behaviors or gender expressions or eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings towards individuals of the opposite gender? Uh, Senator Jaskowski, are you asking Senator Dibble to yield for another I question? I am. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble, will you yield for another question? Yes, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Senator Dibble, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Jaskowski, um, I'm not sure how to respond to your question because that simply doesn't happen. Um, I want to remind the folks in the gallery that you cannot have outbursts in, in the gallery. If you continue to do so, I will instruct the, um, uh, 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 the State Patrol or security to remove you from the gallery. We have to have quiet. And I'm saying that with all due respect. Senator Jaskowski. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for, um, for responding to that question. Um, Again, I haven't seen conversion therapy happening um, for either of those situations, Senator Dibble. Um, I question, I, I share with, with Senator Abler, um, you know, the belief that we have people who are in positions to help young people as they meander and explore and try to find their way through the early part of their life into adulthood. and. I'm afraid that this, this bill will interfere with some very positive, productive uh, things that could, could happen for kids. And I think we need to keep the kids at the forefront of what we do here, whether that's this bill or another one. I also share Senator Utke's concern about us violating the First Amendment with this bill, whether it's freedom of religion or freedom of speech. And I, I think that the bill is vulnerable to that, and I think that we may find ourselves um, being sued. The, the language is not, it's, it, it, it's not really written to be clear concise, um, I think it's wide open to being challenged, Mr. President. Uh, I encourage members to vote no on the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to bring a slightly different perspective to the conversation. Um, so as a um, healthcare provider, we have a database full of information in it that we can look into if we have questions about something. So I can type into this database hypertension or depression and get all the information I need and all the current best practices. When I type in conversion therapy, conversion therapy does not come up because conversion therapy is not a legitimate medical practice. What does come up is the management of transgender and gender diverse children, which I will talk about in a second. And the second thing that comes up is potentially resectable colorectal cancer with liver metastasis because conversion therapy doesn't exist in real medicine. Now, when I go back to the management of transgender and gender diverse youth, it says that there are several guiding principles. One is the safety and well-being of the youth and their family members is, uh, should be at the foremost uh, topic of conversation. And two is that the care for these youth uh, is determined according to the individual gen uh, the individual's gender development needs and goals. And the preferred approach to meeting all these goals is an affirming approach. So lastly, it does, it does mention conversion therapy in one sentence that says, conversion therapy is considered unhelpful and potentially harmful by most professional organizations. And so that's from the medical community. It's not illegitimate medical practice. 
Um, the other thing I heard talked about a lot today was the patient-physician relationship, which we sometimes care so much about, and we should, and sometimes we could care less. So for example, when we talk about women's health care, we could care less about the patient physician relationship and what happens in that exam room, and we feel like we have every right to legislate on that. However, when it comes to conversion therapy, which is not a legitimate medical practice, we say, oh, we gotta back up, let them do what they do. It's not, it's not, it's not up to us to say. So the inconsistencies are rich, and I just wanted to point those out. Um, this bill does not prevent anyone from talking to someone, talking to your counselor, seeking a therapy, uh, therapist, talking to your religious leader about anything. You can talk all you want. I have mixed feelings about a boy or a girl. Let's talk about it. You should. That's important to talk about those things. What this bill does is that it prevents people in this state from performing illegitimate medical practices on our children. That's what the bill does. And I talked about this in committee um, to give an example. If I were to tell you that getting your colonoscopy would not only not do anything for you, it wouldn't catch cancer, it wouldn't do anything, um, but it would cause about a third of people who after a colonoscopy they wanted to or attempted to kill themselves. Would we still go get colonoscopies? Would this body honestly sit here and go, hey, go, go get your colonoscopy, it's fine, no, not a big deal. Uh, which, by the way, you should get your colonoscopy. Um, but no, we wouldn't. We would step in and we would say that's not okay. And that's what we're doing today. It's not okay to practice things that are not legitimate medical practices on the children of this state. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a beautiful day to be standing on this floor to be voting on this bill, to be speaking on this bill. I often talk about my own journey. I always say that I didn't know I was gay until I was in my mid to late 20s, which is like mostly true, Mr. President. But there was one moment, one moment, when I was 11 years old, it's 1997, I wrote in my diary, what if I'm a lesbian, question mark. I got so scared that someone was gonna read that, that I crossed it out so hard that it went through to the next page. And it wasn't that I was scared that my parents were gonna read it. My parents love me and have supported me my entire life. The reaction when I brought home my first girlfriend was, nice to meet you. That was the extent of it. It wasn't really a coming out, it was more of a dinner. And the reason why I was so scared is because of how the world treated LGBTQ people how the world talked about LGBTQ people. Like it was a choice, a lifestyle. My lifestyle is pretty great. Feed a baby, walk a dog, do laundry, buy the groceries, cook the dinner, talk to the wife, get some sleep. It's a great lifestyle. But it's who I am. It's who I've always been. Conversion therapy is literally torture. It is not a medical practice. And we have the opportunity today in this chamber to say we are not going to let these practices continue in our state because LGBTQ young people are cherished and beloved for exactly who they are, exactly how they are, always. And that we will not let literal torture be inflicted upon them. We will not let this bunk science be passed off as medical care. There's been questions about whether or not conversion therapy happens in Minnesota. It does. In fact, there was a letter submitted to the other body in January of this year from the former leaders of large conversion therapy practices. They said, at one time, we were not only deeply involved in conversion therapy, we were the founders, leaders, and promoters. We thought that believing and teaching that sexual orientation and gender identity needed mending was fine. That being LGBTQ meant you were broken. Something was morally wrong with you. We could fix it. It was toxic. 
Recovery from this therapy is difficult at best. Some remain forever scarred. We stand now united in our conviction that it is not therapy, but it is ineffective and harmful. We align ourselves with every major mainstream medical organization and mental health organization denouncing this practice. We have witnessed, taken part in, the incredible harm done to those who have attempted to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. Members, these are the people who started the organizations that did these practices in Minnesota that continue to this day. It does happen here, and it inflicts mental anguish on the people who are being told that it's a choice that they're making, that they're broken, that they're wrong. They are not. They are beautiful. They are perfect. And I want them to hear that. Because I stand in this chamber as somebody who's been married for exactly how long it's been legal to be married, that this body voted on. That in this chamber, instead of talking about LGBTQ people as others, they're us. We are on this floor. We are part of this chamber. We get to do something beautiful today. So members, I hope you vote green because there are not that many times when you get to be part of the heroes of history. But when we vote today, and I hope you vote green, a picture of this board will appear in history books, and the people who voted green will be those heroes. Thank you. Senator Caroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think there are uh, serious First Amendment issues with this bill. Uh, I agree with Senator Limmer that this bill should have come through the Judiciary Committee where we could have uh, fleshed these issues out and um, had a robust discussion. It's very unfortunate that that didn't happen. Um, but quite frankly, I'm, I'm against conversion therapy um, as that term is commonly understood and as it's been described in this chamber. Uh, I'm firmly against anyone who practices uh, coercive physical force practices. Um, and if that were the bill in front of us, I would happily vote yes in banning those practices. Um, we must treat all of our children with patience and love and with dignity. My concern with this bill is the broad language used to define what conversion therapy is, the inclusion of gender identity, uh, which is my understanding as a new component from previous iterations of this bill, and the prohibition on counseling that I do not believe is conversion therapy as that term is commonly understood or has been described uh, today. My concern is that families are going to lose um, a neutral option for therapy under this law. I think there has to be a neutral way for families to seek therapy in love for their child who has gender identity questions about themselves that doesn't result in automatically going down the road of what this bill calls gender-affirming care. With the broad definition and the disciplinary action provided in this bill to therapists, I think that will be the practical effect of this bill. Families need choices to get their children legitimate therapy that best fits their family, their beliefs, and their faith. Thank you, Mr. President. We're now going to the last speaker, who is the bill author, Senator Scott Dibble. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members, for the thorough discussion and the respectful debates. And um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to respond to all of the questions. They were good questions, important questions to ask, um, because they helped illuminate what the bill does and what it does not do. Um, Members, I just I, I did want to respond to a couple of things before I get into my concluding statement. Um, just to be sure we're clear on a couple of points. Conversion therapy, as we understand it today, as we understand therapy today, does not have to be physical coercion or torture to be grievously and deeply damaging 
to the lives of young people. It absolutely can be talk or cognitive therapy. Physical coercion does exist in some settings. That's unfortunate. It is fortunately rare and unusual, certainly not the extreme practices that Senator Abler described. So, um, uh, if you are finding some refuge in voting against this bill because you stand against physical therapy, um, because that's damaging to young people, um, but what this bill prohibits somehow might, prohib might bar things that help young people, I'm telling you, you have no refuge. The clinical evidence, the lived experience, what we know to be true from literally dozens of professional organizations, professional healthcare providers. Look at the packet of letters you have endorsing the passage of this bill from Hennepin Healthcare, the Minnesota Psychological Association, the Mental Health Legislative Network, from Syl Dwyer, a licensed marriage and family therapist, from Children's Minnesota, Dr. Angela Gepford, Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians, Minnesota Medical Association, National Association of Social Workers, Minnesota, Minnesota Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. They're all saying people's lives are devastated by conversion therapy as we understand it today. So please don't feel like you have refuge in keeping children away from harm because there's no waterboarding that occurs. Members, I'm just going to speak plainly. Conversion therapy is heinous and barbaric. Whether it's physical pressure or cognitive therapy, heinous and bar barbaric. It destroys lives, divides families, it isolates people from their community, from their faith, from themselves. It doesn't allow them to be their true, authentic human selves. I wish some of my colleagues could hear themselves. The premise of conversion therapy is that something is wrong with a person, that they're disordered. And that is just not true. Young LGBTQIA people, all LGBTQIA people, are exactly who they are supposed to be. So conversion therapy is torture in all of its forms. It's not therapy. It's not a medical practice. It's not legitimate. So today we say enough. It stops here. It stops in Minnesota. In this state, in Minnesota, this state, we love our children. They are born perfect. They are welcome. They are beautiful. Members, context and moment is important. Here we are going to say there is no more erasure, no more coordinated and intentional efforts to eliminate an entire people in a whole community. Not as if anyone can do that. We have been here forever, and we have endured so much throughout history. We're still here. And we are tough. And our fight for recognition is a beautiful American story of expanding who counts, who matters, who is free, who gets to enjoy the liberties guaranteed in our state and federal constitution. Members, today I want to remember some courageous people who came forward over these past 10 plus years to sit at the testifying table of numerous committees who went to your offices to speak with you, who wrote letters and sent emails and had showed up at your town hall meetings to tell their story. They were incredibly brave and courageous to tell their stories of pain and perseverance and triumph. People like Jacob, Junior, Roger, Will, 
And I want to remember, people were speculating on Monday uh, whether I was running the Boston Marathon. I was not running the Boston Marathon. I was returning. I did run it 10 years ago. Uh, so so when, there, when the bomb occurred, so maybe that's why people were wondering if I was at the Boston Marathon. I was coming back from Illinois from the funeral of a young man, 21 years old. Owen is his name. And they don't make him sweeter and kinder and more gentle and loving than Owen Osborne. And he died of an overdose. He had lived largely closeted life and had been outed to his grandmother, who then condemned him for who he was, and it was devastating to him. We lost one on the way. So when we talk about the kinds of suffering that does occur in the young lives of some LGBTQ people, it's not because they're gay, it's because of the pressure and the negativity and the rejection that's heaped on them. Senator Grunhagen, I'm glad your friend found a different way, but I bet he was depressed for reasons that aren't because he was LGBTQ. It was because of the pressure he was getting, the negativity he was getting from the society in which we live. This is our opportunity to say it can be different. You're beautiful. The thing that matters the most in life, love, is a good thing. And you are a good person. And I want to send, finish with a message to parents who love their children. And my message is simple. Keep doing that. Keep loving your children, even when people who you respect and admire might be telling you something is wrong with them. Nothing is wrong with them. Love them and support them and uphold them. And we join you in doing that today. Thank you, members. Members, just a gentle reminder, even to those who are in the gallery, that once the vote occurs, no matter what the vote is, that we must please remain quiet in the gallery. And I'm saying that with love and respect. With that, the secretary will take the roll on final passage of House File 16. Senator Friends, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. S Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Muhammad votes aye. Senator Muhammad votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. And Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7, just stand when you're ready. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Westrom votes no. And Senator Westrom votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. All the others have asked to be excused. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 36 ayes and 27 noes, the bill passed and its title agreed to. Members, we will now go to the special orders list on general orders number 152, House File 
366, Senator Morrison, for the release of health records limitations in cases related to reproductive health. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. I have to compose myself here for a sec. <laughs> uh, members, I'm proud to present House File 366 to the body today. The Reproductive Freedom Defense Act will protect Minnesota health care providers, Minnesota residents, and patients from around the country against legal attacks and criminal penalties imposed by anti-abortion extremists in other states. It will protect providers of reproductive health care that is provided legally in Minnesota. It will protect the patients that seek that care in Minnesota, and it will protect anyone who assists them with obtaining it. States across the country, including Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri, Alabama, and others, have passed or introduced laws that criminalize abortion with penalties that can include fines, imprisonment, and revocation of medical licenses for abortion providers. Legislators in South Carolina, Arkansas, Texas, and Kentucky have introduced bills that explicitly reference homicide charges for abortion. Homicide is punishable by the death penalty in all of those states. If these bills become law, a person who has an abortion could be subject to the death penalty and be executed. These laws do not just reflect different ideologies, members. They radically interfere with the standard of care and the practice of medicine. And without our action, they will reach within our borders following patients and preventing them from receiving life-saving medical care or punishing them for receiving such care and penalizing the Minnesota professionals that continue to legally provide it. The examples of the harm being caused are legion, but allow me to share just a few. A 28-year-old woman from Texas learned that her fetus would not develop a skull and had a severely underdeveloped brain. She risked serious complications of pregnancy that put her physical and emotional health at risk if she continued the doomed pregnancy. But she was only able to get an abortion because she had the means to travel to Washington where it was legal to receive the recommended medical care for her diagnosis. A woman in Florida broke her water at 17 weeks, a condition called preterm premature rupture of the membranes. This is a difficult and dangerous diagnosis that puts a person at risk of infection and hemorrhage. The standard of care is to offer termination of pregnancy, and many people choose that option. Distraught and afraid, she went to an emergency room where she was given antibiotics and sent home. Her story reflects a new reality in anti-abortion states across the country. Patients with potentially life-threatening pregnancy complications are being denied care that was available before the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. They are being denied life-saving care because doctors and hospitals fear the legal risk they'd face for offering and providing standard of care medical care. A mother in Louisiana endured bleeding during her first trimester of pregnancy because of Louisiana's anti-abortion restrictions. Doctors would not see her until she was 12 weeks pregnant for fear they would be implicated in the now gray area between miscarriage and abortion. She did eventually miscarry painfully and with potential complications over several weeks. Doctors would not confirm, much less appropriately manage her miscarriage because they were unsure if they were allowed to under the law. Her husband at times feared for her life, and she said they felt totally abandoned and just completely written off by the physicians they felt they were, that felt they were legally unable to provide the care she needed. So what should happen when patients like this seek care here in Minnesota? Providers here are seeing more patients from farther away across the United States than ever before. Patients are coming from Texas, Louisiana, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and other states because they need an abortion, because they need miscarriage management, or because their lives are at risk because of their home state laws. They deserve access to that care, and our medical pro providers should not have to risk their medical licenses and their livelihoods to provide it. Members, watching these laws being introduced and passed in other states and then being allowed to stand in the courts is shocking and dangerous, and we cannot sit idly by. While these unprecedented and dangerous new laws are being Im implemented and challenged, 
The Reproductive Freedom Defense Act will protect providers and patients and prevent Minnesota's courts and institutions from being hijacked and weaponized in service of the anti-abortion agenda of people outside of Minnesota. The bill would protect those who provide and seek care here in three ways. Number one, the bill ensures that the law governing the release of health records excludes out-of-state subpoenas and court orders for records related to abortion, contraception, and other reproductive health care. This ensures that disclosure laws cannot be weaponized for other states' prosecution of health care protected under Minnesota law. Number two, the bill protects providers and patients and friends, family, and others who assist them against subpoenas, actions, and judgments for providing or accessing reproductive health care that is legal in Minnesota. And third, the bill ensures that out-of-state conviction for the routine practice of reproductive health care that is legal in Minnesota is not cause for discipline by medical or nursing boards. Under this bill, Minnesota will not help arrest or extradite Minnesota providers or others charged with providing or helping patients access legal, appropriate medical care. In its essence, members, the bill protects patients and providers who receive or give reproductive health care that is legal in Minnesota from restrictive reproductive health care laws in other states. Members with nearly, nearly one in three American women between the ages of 14 and 44 living in a state that bans abortion. It is crucial to act now to protect patients and providers in Minnesota and those coming from out of state seeking care. And with that, Mr. President, I would like to offer the A1 Amendment. Senator Morrison offers the A1 Amendment. The Secretary will report the A1 Amendment. Senator Morrison moves to amend House File Number 366 as follows, page 3 after line 26, insert. This is the A1 Amendment. Senator Morrison to your A1 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President and members, this amendment adds pharmacists to the list of health care professionals that are protected in Minnesota. This amendment ensures that pharmacists who practice in Minnesota and follow Minnesota law are protected from restrictive anti-abortion laws in other states. Uh, Senator Friends. Yes, Mr. President. I'd request a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator Abler. Oh, that's it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Uckey. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, this legislation pushes Minnesota towards extensive litigation over constitutional issues with other states. Um, we are getting into telling them what they can and cannot do and how we're going to protect people. Uh, this bill concerns abortions and abortion services, which has proven to be very controversial. The choice to extend the laws of Minnesota beyond our borders is unconstitutional, unconstitutional and will make Minnesota taxpayers liable for legal challenges and expensive payouts. This bill says that if a medical professional in another state violates their state's laws relating to abortions or abortion services and receives a felony in court or is refused a medical license or a reprimand because through disciplinary action, um, that we are going to turn our backs and say welcome to Minnesota and come practice. So with that, Mr. President, I would like to offer the A51 Amendment. Uh, Senator Uckey, is this a, an amendment to the amendment? If it is not, we have an amendment that we're on right now. The A1 amendment is the one that we're on right now. Oh. So I can come back to you after this, uh, the, the A1 amendment is, uh, is resolved. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I jumped the gun. Okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. No problem. Any other, uh, anyone else to the A1 amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on the A1 amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Friends, for those voting under rule.
Senator French, for those voting under Rule 40.1. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Dizik votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Mohammed votes aye. Senator Mohammed votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.1. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. And Senator Westrom votes no. And Senator Westrom votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 34 ayes and 28 noes. The A1 amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Uckey. Uh, Senator Uckey, if I can go to Senator Abler, because I just remembered that I did have him first, because he did ask to be first after Senator Morrison. Senator Abler. Mr. President, I'm happy to share either way. So I, I thank you for the chance to speak on this. Um, we did hear, the, hear this bill in our committee and we had, a, I think, a, a good discussion about it. Um, and I, I think we're fully aware of what it's attempting to do and um, you know, that's the, the right of those people who get to bring forward ideas. Um, I, uh, I'm disappointed though, Mr. President, uh, we, um, have spent a lot of time in this body and in committees uh, talking about budgets and just a huge amount of time talking about abortions. And uh, I have no intention to relitigate 14 hours of debate on the floor, Mr. President, but just to remind us that there was an election and people were going door to door. And as you know, I went to a whole lot of doors. And there was a, a good number of people, um, maybe slightly less than than the ones who uh, didn't want to uh, do the kind of work that's going on here with House File 1, but it was you know, 55, 45 or something. And, um, and they, those who were concerned, they wanted to be sure you protected Roe versus Wade so that that was squared away, to, and particularly in the first trimester. That was really what I took as the message, that it should be available. And instead, we, we took Roe versus Wade and took it all the way up to the day before birth, which is the current law, which Hopefully it will not happen much, but it's not considered anything unethical at this point to do that. And, um, and now we have a, another piece of, and I, I, was, I still remain troubled by that, Mr. President. And it, it bothers me um, that people who think that if you want to have an abortion stop after viability at 23 weeks are somehow called extreme. And, Mr. President, there are very few people I know who think that's a good idea to have a baby, uh, a, a, a pregnancy terminated when the uh, child um, could be born. And in fact, there's even a piece of legislation passing through here that after they're born alive, they could be deemed not a person. Right now they're deemed a person, which I think is really good. I think they become a person a whole lot earlier. And I think that as we talk about essential health care, we talk about car accidents, we talk about cancer, we talk about people who have some kind of COVID or other things, and somehow in that category comes abortion as essential health care. And personally, Mr. President, I find that troubling, particularly when the people who think that abortions for sure should be arrested post-viability are somehow considered extreme. And 
I just can't get away from this discussion without talking about that. And Mr. President, I'm gonna remind the body and you of the people who I talk to that are those people who are so extreme that they think there's two people involved in this discussion. That there's the, the woman and her family and the challenges that they're going through. And it's not easy um, having children anywhere along the way. Uh, even worse when they get out sometimes, Mr. President. Um, but there's another person in this discussion. And I was disappointed a couple days ago when Senator Coleman suggested that the extra embryos uh, that were created during a fertility effort could be turned back to the, to the family for, for a proper, proper burial. Is that they could be offered that. They didn't have to do it. Just as another respect for the value of those individuals um, being alive. Uh, so, and here we are now, Mr. President, talking about this. Um, and I totally understand the concern, um, but there's something that I don't understand. I don't understand why anywhere in this country uh, they would have a law that says if you have a, a, a little baby with no head, that somehow that's an abortion. I don't understand where that law even comes from, but I would think that given the give and take uh, that should go in those legislatures, legislatures, that that could be fixed. But Mr. President, I think sometimes those legislatures are just as unreasonable with everybody voting one way on one side and everybody voting the other way on the other side and turning away really rational thoughts as some of the votes we've had on this floor where some of the really good ideas that would have improved a bill, causing only benefit to it, were turned away with, I will predict, uh, little regard for the content. And that's where those laws come from, Mr. President, and that's just wrong. And I totally agree that if you were, we've had three, uh, we had a stillbirth and two miscarriages. Um, and I can tell you the, the challenges of those families are real and painful, even when they're just a miscarriage along the way, and um, it's not nothing. None of this is not nothing, Mr. President. Um, so here we go again. Um, anyway, Mr. President, and so I get it. Um, those are just my general thoughts on the topic. But Mr. President, uh, as in House File 1, uh, there was a definition of reproductive healthcare services, which was unlimited. And if you recall, Mr. President, more than once I brought up the idea that maybe we should know just what those are. And so, Mr. President, I think as I read this and understanding the intention of the author, and in a, some modest way appreciating what they are attempting to do, um, I would move the A52 amendment, Mr. President. Senator Abler moves the A52 amendment. The secretary will report the A52 amendment. Senator Abler moves to amend House File Number 366 as follows: Page one, line 19. Delete the human reproductive. This is a the A52 amendment. Uh, Senator Abler to your A52 amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And just to save Senator Friends from jumping up, I'll request a roll call. Please. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Thank you, Mr. President. And so. I get it. Um, we need to have, I think reproductive health care services are well defined as pregnancy, contraception, and termination of a pregnancy. And I think they're well defined involving medical, surgical, counseling, or referral services related to those items. And I can't think of anything else more than that that we need to include. So I don't know why the, the bill includes, but not limited to. And that's the intention of the amendment. It just um, uh, human reproductive was, was deemed to be duplicative, and I'm not particularly Senator fussy Abler, about the light. I'm sorry to disturb you. I just want to let the body know that the um, amendment should be online now because it took a, a little second for it to get there. And it's my understanding I'm getting the thumbs up that it should be there. Am I right? Okay, it's there now. Senator Abler, sorry to disturb you, but I well, want to let Well, thank you. Let, Mr. President, the, the viewers know. at home, thank you for that. Um, anyway, uh, so anyway, I... I don't think this does anything to undo the bill. I think it merely helps define what it is that we're doing. And so Senator Morrison would yield for a question, Mr. President. 
Senator Morrison will yield. She will yield. Senator Thanks. Abler. So, Senator Morrison, I, I don't remember if we talked about this in the committee, we might have, but can you tell me, like, besides medical, surgical counseling, referral services related to pregnancy, contraception, or the termination of a pregnancy, what else it is that might be included in, but not limited to? Senator Morrison, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the question, Senator Abler. If I understand you, you're wanting to remove human reproductive system from the sentence, from the definition? Uh, Senator Abler, I believe that's a clarifying question. Well, yeah, and that's, I am only because uh, staff suggested it just didn't read very well. Um, what I'm really interested in not having there is the including but not limited to part, and they suggested as a technical way to make it just have the correct syntax that that was duplicative. So I have no intention to mess with at all what you're doing just to clarify that it's those three things. So I, and then, so my question for you, besides whatever else you want to say, and I'm appreciate, oh, sorry, Mr. President, I can't look at her. Um, so just is, what else might there be you want to include, and maybe we should include it, but that's my question. If she would yield and tell me what else the bill leaves out. So Senator Morrison was yielding, Senator Morrison, uh, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Abler. You know, I, I would, prefer to leave that in, given our the courts and uh, many states' sort of obsession with the human, human reproductive system. They seem to spend a lot of time thinking about it and targeting it. I would like to leave it more comprehensive. Um, and so I would ask members to vote no on the amendment. Senator Abler. Thanks, Mr. President. Senator Morrison would yield again, please. Senator Morrison, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Abler. Thanks, Mr. President. and. Um, I had kind of a feeling, I know how this may weigh working up here, but just work out, I just given that I've been here for a while. Um, but Senator Morrison, is it your full intent that this is just topics related to pregnancy and such, and termination of pregnancies and things around that, and not anything else besides that topic and understanding courts and some little nuance that may go beyond some of the words here, but that your focus is really on this subset of that medical care. Senator Morrison, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Abler. Uh, this, there is, uh, there's a lot of complexity and nuance in reproductive health care um, that certainly could apply to several different organs in the body, and so again, I would prefer for the more expansive language to remain in the bill. Senator Abler. Okay. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Actually, I appreciate the answer, although it was, wasn't that solid of an answer. But um, so let's just vote on it and uh, move along with the day. If she would have, if the Senator Morrison would have given me an answer, like, yeah, that's our intent. It's going to be pretty narrow, and I can't think of anything right now. But I, I think that we do, we do want to at least be on record that some of us are worried that this is going to grow into. I don't know what else, Mr. President, but so that's, I'm, I'm done with my comments. Thank you. So the secretary will take the roll on the A52 amendment. <laughs> Senator French, those uh, voting under rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to report Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Howell votes aye. Senator Howell votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. And Senator Cran votes aye. And what's the last one? Senator Coran votes aye. Uh, uh, Senator Coran vo votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Anyone else? All members, all senators uh, um, who had a desire to vote have voted. Um, and the secretary will close the roll. There being 30, excuse me, 29 ayes and 34 nays, the A52 amendment is not adopted. Now I'm going to Senator Uckey. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I won't go back through what I started with, so I will just go right to the A51 amendment. Senator Uckey offers the A51 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Rutke moves to amend House File Number 366 as follows. Page 2, delete Sections 2 and 3. This is the A51 amendment. Senator Rutke, to your A51 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, the A51 amendment uh, addresses the issue that I started to talk about um, a little while ago, and that was these professionals that work in other states and have intentionally violated and broken the state laws or uh, violated their uh, professional boards, uh, rules and regulations, and have either received a uh, court penalty in the form of a felony or had their license jeopardized by their respective boards. Um, these are doctors, uh, or physicians, physicians assistants, nurses, and uh, now with the amendment we just heard a little bit ago, we are opening this up for pharmacists also. Uh, my amendment uh, isn't that up to date, but these people have intentionally violated the rules and laws where they are, but we're saying in Minnesota, and again, those rules and laws that they have violated are all in relation to abortion and abortion services. It's specific to that. Um, it doesn't open it up to other th issues, but if they come to Minnesota, we're willing to overlook that and let them practice here. I just don't think that's right. Uh, we need to uphold and honor the rules and laws of our neighboring states and states across the country. Um, if these people are willing to do it there, what are they willing to do here? Um, so with that, we have the A51 amendment, which eliminates or deletes sections on page two, sections two and three, and on page three, it's sections four and five. And that are, those are the sections that address the various professional um, titles, doctors, the assistants, and the nurses, and uh, it says that we just aren't going to accept those that intentionally um, have broken the law in other states. So with that, members, I would uh, ask for your support. I don't believe we need to encourage those people to come here and, uh, again, who knows what they would uh, do once they're here. Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a roll call on the A51. A roll call has been requested. A roll call has been granted. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. Would the author yield to a question? Um, uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, would the author of the underlying bill yield to a question? Okay, got you. Senator Morrison, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Morrison, so hypothetically how I'm reading this bill, um, you know, some states are starting to try and take action against climate change, even being educated on. And I'm a meteorologist, and so if I had all of my education 
much of which came through from the military, and was a competent member of my field, and was doing everything right. But I was in a state that had banned me talking about that, despite it being scientifically factual. I would hope I would be able to go to another state where all of the things I brought to the table were still embraced. Am I reading this correctly, that this would be a medical professional that was simply someone who had provided care to women and was still fully competent, that we would be inviting into our state, which I think would probably alleviate some of our healthcare shortages? Or what status would a person be in under your bill? Uh, Senator Morrison, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you um, for the analogy, Senator Mitchell. Um, yes, you are right. The, the, these are physicians, nurses, um, physician assistants, and pharmacists who have provided care that is legal in the state of Minnesota. Um, and I want to go back to uh, a statistic I shared in my opening remarks that one in three American women of reproductive age between the ages of 14 and 44 live in a state in the United States that bans abortion. And we already know that banning abortion does not end abortion, so they're going to need to go somewhere to receive the care that they need. So I think we are already seeing more people coming to Minnesota, and we are starting to see health professionals who are unable to care for their patients in the states that they live in that ban abortion move to states that allow the practice of reproductive health care. Senator Mitchell. That answers my question. It sounds like those are people that we would love to have in our state. Thank you. Senator Klein. Senator Makeway. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, I think, I think there's a good question that Senator Aki asked. Uh, who knows what they would do when they came here? I think there's a good example. Dr. Mac Goldberg, an OBGYN in Tennessee. He had a patient come to him. It's Mayron Michelle Harris, Hollis, excuse me. She was 10 weeks pregnant. She had just given birth not that long ago, and the embryo had implanted in the scar tissue from her recent cesarean. At any moment, her pregnancy could rupture. It would blow open her uterus. It could impact her bladder. Even if she was literally in a surgical suite, she could bleed out in minutes. Like, saving her life might not be possible. And that was if she's in the surgical suite. She absolutely needed to have an abortion. However, the state of Tennessee has a law banning all abortions, no exceptions. What they do have in this horribly written law is an affirmative defense. If you perform an abortion in the state of Tennessee, you get charged with that felony, but you're allowed in a court of law to say, no, I had, I had to, to save the pregnant person's life. Now, at what point would the doctor be saving the pregnant person's life? Because at the point when he wanted to provide her with care, she was just pregnant. Her uterus could rupture. Her bladder could be impacted. She could bleed out. By the time it happened, it would be too late. That is the kind of person that Tennessee would charge with a felony. Those are the kind of people who will come to the state of Minnesota. What will they do here? Save people's lives. People are dying. There was a young girl in Wyoming who could not get an abortion, and she was literally in an ambulance, and she died trying to go to another state to get care. I cannot overstate the seriousness of this. And the laws that are written about abortion care are written by politicians, not doctors. And so there is no way to write into law the specific when and why and how that you can provide care to pregnant people because pregnancy is unique to every specific person who is pregnant. And they've criminalized this very common safe health care procedure and threatened to put these doctors in jail, charge them with felonies, ruin their practices. Half of the OBGYNs in Idaho have left. So going back to the question, who knows what they would do? They would deliver babies in Minnesota. They would provide reproductive health care in Minnesota. They would save the lives of pregnant people in Minnesota. They would help shepherd them through risky and complicated pregnancies. 
They would treat postpartum preeclampsia like I had. That's what they would do. Sounds amazing to me. So, members, I'm going to encourage you to vote no on this amendment because what is happening across this country is a freaking health crisis. But in Minnesota, we don't have to have that, and we can have all the wonderful people that are helping their patients in their states. We can have them here. Please vote no. The last person to, to speak on the A51 amendment will be the author, if he has anything else to say. Anything else to say, Senator Uckey? Thank you, Mr. President. And members, I would ask for a green vote on this, because the stories we've heard and examples we've heard are, are good, but in these cases, We're talking about people who have been convicted in their states. They have broke the law. They have broke um, the, the, what they're supposed to uh, abide by for their, to maintain their license. They simply thumb their nose at the system. They weren't, we're not talking about people who are caring for those in emergencies um, in that type of crisis time. Um, we just we want those that are willing to uphold their state laws, uphold the, their licenses, and we definitely welcome to our state because, to, of course, like anybody, we're, we can always use more people, more professionals in every instance because we're short of uh, employees. But I don't think it's good to reward these people who intentionally broke the law. So with that, I would ask for your support, and let's maintain the quality of professionals that we have here in Minnesota. Thank you. The secretary would take the roll on the A51 <laughs> amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator French, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to report that Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.1. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. And Mr. President, Senator Coran votes aye. And Senator Coran votes aye. All senators. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 29 yeas and 34 noes. The A51 amendment is not adopted. Any further uh, um, amendments? Uh, Senator Uckey. Thank you, Mr. President. I've got uh, one more part of this bill that I'd like to uh, address. And with that, we have the A2 amendment. Senator Uckey offers the A2 amendment. The secretary will report the A2 amendment. Senator Uckey moves to amend House File Number 366 as follows. Page 5 to 7, delete sections 8 to 13. This is the A2 amendment. Senator Uckey, to your A2 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And 
Members, this bill or this amendment uh, deletes um, some sections of as we get further in um, on pages uh, five through seven, deletes sections eight to 13. And with that language, we are uh, telling courts in our state not to apply the law if it affects or relates to th the abortion services that we've been talking to. Uh, it also, a court in this state shall not enforce or satisfy a civil judgment received through. Um, and we're telling that others that the immunities of this state carry on and across the borders. Um, we need to respect and honor the other states around us. Um, and we're willing to overlook their laws and we just have never done that before. Um, this isn't right now, it hasn't been right before, and we just haven't done it. And so with that, I don't think this is the proper bill to start telling others that this is gonna be a sanctuary spot. Um, you can come here and do whatever you want and in violation of uh, the laws where you actually came from. So uh, with that, members, I would hope that you could support this and uh, not start something new that we've Never been down this uncharted ground before, so thank you. Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a roll call on the A2. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Uh, Senator uh, Mitchell. Would the amendment author yield to a question? Senator Uckey, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Mitchell. So for example, Senator Uckey, uh, Texas has a law on the books that instructs the courts to award plaintiffs at least $10,000, um, even regular citizens, if they are able to find someone who aids or abets in an abortion. So, if a doctor is in a position where a woman, in his or her opinion, is about to die, and they aid or abet in an abortion, potentially saving that person's life, and anyone reports them, do you think it is the right outcome that that doctor who saved a life should be fined $10,000 or more? Senator, I'll get you the question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know what, that you're talking about a law and people in Texas, we have no right and no jurisdiction over their laws, just like they don't over ours. Um, so I don't believe that that is anything that we, it even pertains to what we're talking about here. Um, we're a land and a country of laws and they would address that where they're at. Senator Mitchell. Uh, I do not have any further questions, but I would like to say I asked for an opinion. That is not what I heard back. Um, I would say most people in our country, including many in Texas, think that that is not how things should go and that someone should not be fined for saving a life. And so I appreciate that this bill protects doctors who have done the right thing. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Utke, uh, for the amendment. You know, I, I just want to remind members that this law should not be necessary. We should not be even having this conversation, but we find ourselves in this position since our Supreme Court overturned the Roe versus Wade decision and said, state legislatures and governors should decide whether or not people are allowed to have reproductive health care that they need. And so many have chosen to impose ideological restrictions on their constituents and on their residents. And in Minnesota, we're saying that you're safe here, that you can get the care that you need here and that you are safe. You're safe to receive the care you need and you're safe to practice medicine here. Please vote no on this amendment, members. Senator Grudenhagen. To the A, I to withdraw. Amendment. I withdraw. Any further, uh, uh, Senator Kroon? 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, we could have a philosophical debate about what the right outcome would be in, in, in a hypothetical situation, um, but we're a nation bound by laws. Uh, the extradition clause in the United States Constitution is pretty clear. If somebody's charged with a crime in one state, then runs to uh, another state, uh, the governor of the state in which the crime was committed can demand the return of that person, and the other state must comply. Um, the commands of the extradition clause are mandatory and afford no discretion to the executive officers or courts of the asylum state. So my concern with this bill is that it has us ignoring extradition demands from other states. We may not like the laws that the other states pass. They may not like the laws that we here in Minnesota pass. Um, but this is the law of our land. And if we go down the road of refusing extradition requests from other states because we don't like the laws they pass, um, maybe other states start doing the same with our laws. And um, I think that clearly <laughs> would lead to a constitutional crisis and chaos. Um, this is not responsible lawmaking, regardless of our feelings about the laws of other states. So I think there are serious constitutional concerns with the extradition clauses in this bill, and I would encourage a yes vote on this amendment. Thank you. Anything else, Senator Erke, or can we go to the vote? You want us to go to the vote? The secretary will take the roll. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, we can go to a vote. Thank you. I'm sorry? Go. Senator McQuaid, I, I made it really clear that we want to go to the vote, uh, but, you, but I'll recognize you right after the, the vote, and if you want to speak to something that was missed, we can certainly do that. The secretary will take the roll. Senator Friends, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Diedzik votes no. Senator Diedzik votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator... Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator who was it? Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator Coran votes aye. Senator Coran votes aye. And Senator Weber votes aye. And Senator Weber votes aye. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 28 ayes and 35 noes, the A2 amendment is not adopted. Senator Mayquay. All right, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Would uh, Senator Morrison, uh, 
uh, yield for a question. Senator Morrison, will you yield? She will yield for a question. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Morrison, I had a question on some of the language in the bill. Uh, and if I could make, make uh, or have your attention go to lines 120 and 2.8. The words that I'm looking at are but not limited to. I know that Senator Abler had a previous amendment which was much more expansive than those words, but uh, when I see the words but limited to, that means that one can interpret this bill with uh, a little bit more uh, broader application. So could you tell me what the intent of but, but not limited to means in this particular instance on lines 1.20 and 2.8? Senator Morrison, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Limmer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the anti-abortion movement has been so creative in finding ways to limit access to reproductive health care that I think it's important that the words remain relating to the human reproductive system, including but not limited to services related to pregnancy contraception or the termination of a pregnancy. Senator Limmer. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I suppose that's... Uh, a broad justification for trying to anticipate anything and everything. Uh, it's not the best way to write law uh, because oftentimes no, no judge, if this ever went to court, would really know what we mean. So, uh, so there must be some intent that we haven't been made aware of. Maybe you don't even have that knowledge at this point because your answer basically anticipates anything and everything that a particular group of people with a different view of yours, uh, you're trying to anticipate and trying to stop. Um, I think it's better if we write specific law rather than broad law. And um, Mr. President, I would like to offer an oral amendment State your oral amendment. On lines 1.20 and lines 2.8, strike the words but not limited to in both instances. The secretary will report the oral amendment, but repeat it one more time. Uh, Mr. President, uh, lines 1.20 or 20, and lines 2.8, remove the words, but not limited to, on both lines. The secretary will report the oral amendment. Senator Limmer moves the following oral amendment to House File Number 366 as follows on page one, line 20, delete, but not limited to, and on page two, line eight, delete, but not limited to. Senator Limmer, do you want to explain your oral amendment? Uh, the, uh, the description made by the secretary is correct. Um, I think I already have described it, but I'll describe it again. When we put words, but not limited to, oftentimes the courts do not know exactly what we intend. And I think it's better to tell the courts as well as the public to uh, depict in our bills and our new laws exactly what we want. And uh, I believe, uh, but not limited to, is making this provision a bit overly broad. Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a roll call on the Limmer oral amendment. Roll call, request a roll call granted. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Limmer. I appreciate your intent. Uh, but again, I think we run into the problem of legislating healthcare and medical practice. 
Uh, and given the climate that exists today with um, the targeting of um, people with a uterus, people who are capable of pregnancy, uh, people with ovaries and fallopian tubes, uh, I think that we need to allow patients and providers uh, the freedom to decide what is best for an individual patient. So, members, I would ask you to vote no on this amendment. Senator Makeway. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I encourage a no vote on this amendment. Um, a, after I had my youngest daughter, uh, you know, she was born by C-section, and she's amazing. And after about six months, I started getting my period again. And I had my period for three years, all the time. That's not normal, members, but it's also not related to pregnancy. It's not related to contraception or the termination of a pregnancy. We are seeing increasingly across this country as Dr. Morrison talked about, the criminalization of healthcare related to uteruses. Eventually, because I had hemorrhaging to the point where my body was just pouring blood, I had to have a hysterectomy that I had to get my husband's permission to have. What if I wasn't married? What if I had been 10 years younger and the doctor wouldn't have wanted to perform a hysterectomy? Because women get asked that all the time. What if you change your mind? What if you want to have babies? What if your future husband, future imaginary husband wants to have babies? Maybe you shouldn't get a hysterectomy. Women are talked out of health care that they need all the time. That's not related to pregnancy, contraception, or the termination of pregnancy, but it is reproductive health care. And it is health care that I should be able to make with my doctor, not with any of you. I don't invite you into my, you know, exam room with my doctor. This is a decision that is between patients and their doctors, and doctors should have the full ability to make those decisions with their patients without our interference. And members, if you think that this is like out of control and not happening, read the news. People with uteruses are dying across this country because doctors don't know if they can provide care. Vote no on this amendment. Senator McQuaid, are you ready? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm wondering if Senator Limmer would yield for a question. Senator Limmer, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Mayquay. Thank you, Mr. President. I, so um, Senator Port very, very concisely talked about this, but even a few years ago, I don't think any of us could imagine the increasing criminalization of the uterus that has happened in this country. And so I have no idea what's coming in the next month. I actually don't know what's coming before 11.59 tonight, or in the next few years, or in the next decade. Um, and so my question to Senator Limmer, Mr. President, would be if the, because this bill, let's, let me just reground, is about ensuring that people who practice healthcare in Minnesota, that is legal healthcare in Minnesota, are not charged with crimes or extradited to other states uh, because it's illegal in that state. So my question for Senator Limmer, Mr. President, is if the state of Texas or the state of Florida that just banned abortion last week, they decide that people cannot have ovarian cysts removed from their ovaries because it, it could interfere with their reproductive ability, which is something that happened to me. I had an ovarian cyst when I was in college. It was the size of an orange. It was very painful. And I had to have it removed. They had to take a tiny part off of my ovary. And my doctor told me, this might affect your ability to get pregnant. Probably not. I think I did a really good job, but it might. So the state of Florida and their infinite unwisdom say, you may not have these kinds of surgeries. It could impact your ability to get pregnant. And we want everyone to be forced to get pregnant and have babies. So 
Senator Limmer, my question to Senator Limmer, Mr. President, is if we remove but not limited to, and the state of Florida bans ovarian cystectomies, how would I be sure that my provider can provide legal care here if they could get charged in Florida because they're licensed to do that there? Senator Limmer, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Senator May Quaid. Uh, I might want to point out in both instances on these lines, this is in regards to health records, not medical practice. But despite that, uh, I'll withdraw my oral amendment, Mr. President. Senator Limmer withdraws his oral amendment. Any additional questions? Any additional um, amendments? If not, the Secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 366, a bill for an act relating to health care, limiting the release of health records in cases related to re reproductive health. Third reading. I'm now making the list if there's anyone who wants to speak on the third reading outside of the author. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, thank you for the discussion about the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act. This is a simple bill that will protect providers of reproductive health care provided legally in Minnesota, and it will protect the patients who seek that care here, and it will protect anyone who assists them with obtaining it. This is a bill that should not be necessary but we find ourselves in an unprecedented legal landscape in the wake of the Dobbs decision. The Supreme Court decided that certain kinds of health care are allowed to be severely restricted or made illegal, in fact criminalized, in states with elected leaders who desire to impose their personal ideological beliefs onto all of their constituents. We cannot allow these laws to reach into Minnesota and harm Minnesota patients and providers. And members, we can be proud today. We can be proud that in Minnesota we're standing with people and we're saying we will not police your body in Minnesota. We are saying you are safe in Minnesota. We are saying that we will protect your bodily autonomy in Minnesota. And we're saying that you can receive the care that you need in Minnesota and that you and your family and your health care providers are safe in Minnesota. Members, please vote green. The secretary will take the roll on House, House File 366. Members, please vote. Sitter friends, are you ready for those voting under Rule 40.7? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Hur votes aye. Senator Hur votes aye. Senator Mohammed votes aye. Senator Mohammed votes aye. And Senator Rest votes aye. And Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Howell votes no. Senator Howell votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Western votes no. Senator Western votes no. Senator Coran votes no. And Senator Coran votes no. And Senator Weber votes no. And Senator Weber votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 34 ayes and 29 noes. The, uh, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. 
Members still under special orders? We are now going to number 164 on general orders, and that would be House File 146. Senator May Quay, General Affirming Health Care, Out of State Law Interference Provisions Modifications. Senator May Quay. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and um, I'd like to move that the amendment made to House File 146 by the Committee on Rules and Administration and the report adopted April 12th, 2023, pursuant to Rule 45, be stricken, and I request a roll call. Roll call. Request a roll call granted. Senator May Quaid moved that the amendment made to House File Number 146 by the Committee on Rules and Administration to the report adopted on April 12th, 2023, pursuant to Rule 45, be stricken. Any discussion? Senator Abler. So, thanks, Mr. President. Does that mean we're taking the House, the other body's language as it is? Yes. Thank you. And the Secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. You're voting on the motion to strike pursuant to Rule 45 and utilize the House language. Senator Friends, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Hur votes aye. Senator Hur votes aye. Senator Muhammad votes aye. Senator Muhammad votes aye. And Senator Rest votes aye. And Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Say it one more time. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Western votes no. Senator Western votes no. Senator Coran votes no. Senator Coran votes no. And Senator Weber votes no. And Senator Weber votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the, the secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 29 noes, the motion prevails. <laughs> Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, I want to start with just a little grounding. Since the existence of humanity, trans people have existed. Transgender people have always existed. They are beloved, cherished members of our community. They are siblings, parents, artists, nurses, doctors, veterans and active service members. They're mechanics and singers. They're writers and lawmakers. For some transgender people, being transgender is the least interesting thing about them. But I will say again, transgender people are beloved members of our community. There's a long and shameful history of our government's discrimination against LGBTQ people. But over the last 30 years, support and acceptance of the LGBTQ community has grown. And after marriage equality became law of the land, which I am personally very grateful for, anti-LGBTQ hate groups needed to pivot and find a new issue to coalesce their voters and donors around while also continuing their quest to peel back public support for the LGBTQ community. And quite honestly, they flailed around for a bit. Literally, early, earlier this week, one of the leaders of those hate groups said, well, what did it look like? We threw everything at the wall. They tried everything. They spent a few years trying to deny people like me and my wife marriage licenses, uh, creating exemptions to civil rights law to allow private businesses to shame and turn away LGBTQ people in places of public accommodations, and continuing to challenge marriage equality in court, which we still see today. But in 2018, anti-LGBTQ hate groups finally found their new strategy, targeting transgender people the smallest portion of the LGBTQ community. And here we are, just three years 
after the first trans sports ban was signed into law, which I really want to note was signed into law the week the pandemic started. That was the highest priority in the state of Utah, the week the pandemic came to America, banning trans girls from playing kickball. So we've gone from banning trans girls from playing kickball to banning gender-affirming care to the state is going to take away your children if you allow them to access gender-affirming care, or if you allow their sibling to access gender-affirming care, or if you access gender-affirming care. I've used that word a lot, gender-affirming care. What is it? Gender-affirming care is developmentally appropriate health care that helps transgender people be seen, safe, and comfortable in who they are. It's access to life-saving care that improves mental health and overall well-being in transgender youth and adults, as evidenced in decades of peer-reviewed scientific research studies. Gender-affirming care practices are widely supported by every major medical organization, including the American Medical Association, who we trust to do uh, care practices for diabetes and hypertension. Supported by the American Psychological Association, who we trust to guide care practices for depression and anxiety. And the American Association of Pediatrics, who we trust to guide to do care practices that guide um, anything from asthma to pediatric cancer. Despite this, states across this country have taken shocking action to target and harm, and ultimately, because they've said it, get rid of transgender people. In an effort to save trees, I didn't print out all of the headlines of all the states. There's a lot. I just did a handful. So on desks, Mr. President, you'll see headlines like Texas governor calls on citizens to report parents of transgender kids for abuse. Idaho lawmakers seek to punish parents who take trans youth to other states for health care. The situation in our region is rapidly devolving as harmful legislation advances. I will be honest with you, Mr. President, I tried to write this speech earlier this week, and I had to stop because every single day, a new state banned gender-affirming care. I was going to be inaccurate by the time we got today, to today if I didn't write the speech this morning. And I'm actually not 100% sure that another state hasn't banned gender-affirming care in the last five minutes. I'm actually not. But as of April 18th, I'm pretty sure, our neighboring states of Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota have banned gender-affirming care. And in Missouri, they ban it for literally everyone. And that's why we're here today with Senate File 63. Senate File 63 is a bill that would protect any patient who comes to Minnesota to access health care, their parents who come with their children to Minnesota to access health care, and providers here in Minnesota who provide health care to protect them from being prosecuted, extradited to other states, charged with felonies, and jailed. Now, it's important to say again that gender-affirming care is developmentally appropriate health care for transgender people. But it's more important to say that gender-affirming care reduces severe depression and suicidality by incredible rates. A 2022 JAMA study showed that gender-affirming care uh, patients were 60% less likely to experience moderate to severe depression and 73% less likely to contemplate self-harm or suicidality. Those are amazing statistics. Amazing statistics. I believe the effective rate for talk therapy and SSRIs is like 30%. Gender-affirming care for trans people, more than double that. Amazing. But here's the thing, Mr. President. Senate File 63 really isn't about what I think or what anybody else thinks about gender-affirming care. Senate, 60, Senate File 63 really isn't what I think about or what anybody else thinks about transgender people. I love trans people. That's what I think. But it's not about that. Senate File 63 is about ensuring every person who accesses or provides legal health care here in Minnesota will not be punished for doing so. And it's that simple. And so members, I ask for your support today. I ask for a green vote. And I also ask that as we move through this discussion, we keep in our hearts the young people who know what their legislators say about them. There have been studies that show that even when there are positive bills about trans kids and positive discussions about trans kids, there are still negative effects because we stand here and debate their existence like it's up for debate when it's not. We love them. They're cherished. They're beloved. So I hope I can earn everybody's support on this bill. It is right that Minnesota continues to be a beacon of care, compassion, and personal freedom. And that is why we are here with Senate File 63 today. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler. 
Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator May Quaid, I, uh, I appreciate listening to you, and I've gotten to know you a lot better um, and understanding many things uh, about you, and, uh, and that uh, and you're special to me as a person. Um, I um, just have to react to a few things. I, I don't think use of the word hater, at least in the context of Minnesota, is an appropriate word. I don't think it's... It's just an inappropriate word. It, it, um, I don't know of anybody who hates anybody who is uh, LGBT um, or the whole bit of that. I, that's just not where we are, Mr. President. Uh, it's not where Minnesota is. Um, maybe there's other states where it seems like that. I, I cannot speak for those states. But I, um, in the same way I reacted to Senator Morrison and the use of the word extremists, um, I just have to repel that word because it doesn't reflect my views. We can have sincere disagreements and concerns, but none of that rises to any level regarding that. I just wanted to get that clear. Um, and I don't know anybody who doesn't want people to be seen safe and comfortable. And uh, I think that's, everybody in this chamber would agree with that, Mr. President. And so, um, what we're talking about is a bill to create um, some protections uh, for some people. Um, and we'll discuss, somebody else will discuss in more detail, probably if that's even legal to do that and ignore other states. Um, but I have a, a singular concern about this bill, Mr. President, and it has to do with what will happen to uh, families in Minnesota who failed to provide gender-affirming care. And with that regard, Mr. President, I will offer the A-50 Amendment. Senator Abler offers the A-50 Amendment. The Secretary will report the A-50 Amendment. Senator Abler moves to amend House File Number 146 as follows. Page 2, delete Section 3. This is the A-50 Amendment. Senator Abler, to your A-50 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, I appreciate the at attention to this section. Uh, I, I'm not here to engage in big word, in uh, inflammatory words and slogans. I'm here simply to address my concern about the child protection aspect of this bill, which in my conversations at the Rules Committee uh, on this bill and with Senator May Quaid, and I thank her for her interaction on that. Uh, caused me to be extremely concerned uh, about uh, this part of the bill. Um, and so what this legislation does in Section 3, it goes into the emergency, the Court of Emergency, Jur emergency Jurisdiction, uh, and, and it addresses a section where it talks about what to do if you find a child who's abused or abandoned or several other really bad things that are happening and why indeed the court has to act in an urgent manner uh, to save this child from the perils that they are uh, experiencing. Uh, there is just nothing much worse, Mr. President, than abandoning a child or abusing them or doing the other list of things that are in this bill. Um, and so, for some reason, the authors of this bill and the promoters, I don't even imagine Senator May Quaid, but whoever brought this bill to her, thought that this is an important piece to add, to add the failure to provide gender-affirming care into this section. And Mr. President, I have uh, spent some time uh, online and on the phone. I've talked to three judges, and uh, one of my friends talked to a fourth judge. I've talked to a county attorney and several lawyers who specialize in child protection law. And they say, wow. Well, they said other things too, but they were, that's the summary of their like, with an exclamation mark, like, holy buckets. And so what this is doing, it's declaring that the failure to be provided gender-affirming care is something to be protected from. It's a protection for these individuals, defined as a protection, um, along with being protected from abuse, protected from abandonment, protected from the other items listed in this bill. And the way, and it's unclear how it's going to be implemented, but it's in this section that requires emergency action. Not just like, you know, they really should get going, um, well, they're, you know, they've, you know, we'll get around to it in the child, the regular court system where they, where they do hopefully timely justice. But it says, no, this has to be addressed as an emergency. 
The same level of emergency where someone's in abuse and you're like, oh no, they're, they're not feeding the child, they're, they've been gone for two days, uh, this eight-year-old child or, or whatever. It's in that section. And to a person, they said, this will impact the child protection system. And I respect Senator May Quaid, and she said, it does absolutely not do that. I cannot get that from my experts who are telling me, yes, it does. And how it will interact in the court system is on yet to be seen, but it will impact that system. And so you have a family, and, and, and the intention that was the bill is to help people who are in Texas. And I understand what could go on there. And so you have a, a couple who have a child, and maybe they're separated. And so the, the daughter wants to get some care, and one of the spouses says, the, the custodial spouse says, um, yeah, we're going to go do that. The non-custodial spouse could then go to, to court in Texas and get an order based upon that the other spouse is doing some illegal behaviors, and they go like, oh, yeah, it's illegal. We can't have that. And so then they come to Minnesota, and they need some action to decide who gets to do what actions. And so I understand what they are trying to do, but what they've done by putting it in this section, they are creating it as an urgency at the level of abuse or abandonment. And that is going to mess with people in Minnesota. And I'm really disappointed, uh, Mr. President. I don't know if you're not on rules. I don't, oh, you're on rules, right? Anyway, um, so you, we sat there and I brought this thing, I, or, Rule 21, into rules because of this very concern that I did not discuss on the floor, Mr. President, because we don't do that. Um, but I took it to rules with the express concern about this. And then it should go to the Human Service Committee to see what happens and flesh out what happens with these child protection cases. And maybe go back to judiciary to finish the discussion, which, Mr. President, was discussed in like one question and one answer in judiciary. It has not been fleshed out at all and never got to the Human Service Committee. And so uh, at the Rules Committee, I was informed that there was an amendment uh, adopted way back in February that talked about in another state. Like, oh, okay, we're, well, we're good. So it's in another state, it's not for Minnesota people. Well, and that was uncomfortable as I read it further, Mr. President, but now that language isn't even here. So there is no protection of any sort for somebody in this state where there's a spousal disagreement or the neighbor or the coach or the doctor or the, social, the counselor at school says, this child has been failed to be provided with gender-affirming care, and off we go into the emergency system. Mr. President, the bill will work fine without this. I've spoken to these same individuals, and the bill works just fine without this emergency jurisdiction because, Mr. President, on the matters like the Texas case I mentioned, they're going to get to that right away anyway. So, members, this doesn't need to be here, and please, let's not involve families who have, in Minnesota, who have no idea that they're going to run afoul of the child protection system and, Mr. President, maybe spend $5,000 or more in your profession uh, to try to defend their family and keep their kids from being uh, run through the system and maybe they'll even be put somewhere. So, uh, members, I think this is something really important. Thank you. Senator Mr. Roden. President, I do request a roll call. Roll call, request a roll call granted. Uh, Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I have mentioned previously in this body, I am a foster parent. I also happen to have a law degree. Um, I've worked with abused, neglected children. I've worked as a, point of, a court appointed special advocate. Um, I am pretty familiar with this area. And if there is a family that is in Minnesota, the kids are Minnesota, Minnesota has jurisdiction over that family, period. So Minnesota would not need to get temporary jurisdiction over a family that's in Minnesota. So I was very confused when I was getting all these emails calling this a kidnapping bill because I'd read it, and I was like, what on earth? There is nothing in there that is anything like that. And now that I'm hearing what people think this section means, I understand the confusion, but the fact is, yes, 
a Minnesota family could have an emergency situation, there could be emergency removals. We do that for all sorts of things in the foster care realm. I'm not saying for this, I'm just saying in general. But temporary jurisdiction means you're trying to figure out who should really have jurisdiction, which means there is another state involved. So this absolutely does not apply to a family that is entirely in Minnesota. This does not give the Minnesota courts the right to go into a family in Minnesota and, and take a child away or anything like that. This is the situation where a child has maybe run away from an unsafe situation or one of the parents is in Minnesota with the child and there's a parent somewhere else, things like this. This is something where there is a connection with another state and we need this emergency thing in place while we can figure it out. So I would urge everyone to vote against this amendment because how it is being described is not what is going on in this bill. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. I too rise to support uh, the A50 amendment and Senator Abler uh, laid out the reasoning for it very well. And Mr. President and members, I don't doubt the sincerity of the authors and the proponents and the views that they are having on this bill, but the language in the statute is not reflecting what they are saying this bill will accomplish. And it starts with these obscure lines that are in the bill that we often overlook as we go to the title and the meat of the actual language. I'm going to point you to this section, line 2.26 of the bill. We often skip these top header lines of what statute it's going in to go to the, the title of the statute and then go into the meat of what it's actually doing. But line 2.26 says, section 3, Minnesota Statutes 2022, section 518D.204 is amended to read. The fact that it is being put in the section 518D part of law means it's going against what the proponents are claiming this bill is going to do. I have pulled up section 518D. I've been reviewing it. I have had some of these same family law experts talked with a gentleman yesterday who's been in this dealing with, uh, dealing with child protection attorney cases and the well-being of children for 25, 30 years. And the issue in this, this, this amendment is trying to address is not just temporary jurisdiction that the previous speaker talked about. There's one word missing in there, what 518D.204 is doing, temporary emergency jurisdiction. There are two qualifications that you need to meet for temporary emergency jurisdiction. We are not debating here whether a Minnesota family is under the jurisdiction of Minnesota courts. That's not what is up for debate. Obviously, yes, all Minnesota families are under the jurisdiction of Minnesota courts. When does a court have temporary emergency jurisdiction? over a family, and under current law in this statute, it comes with two places. One, it's line, it's line A on line 2.28 of the bill. If a child is present in this state and one of the following factors under it, such as the child has been abandoned, uh, the child needs emergency protection because of threatening or mistreatment or abuse, or other things that are down this list. Now this bill is going to insert into it a child has been unable to obtain gender-affirming health care as defined in section 543.23. I know that the proponents of this bill sincerely believe that this is not impacting Minnesota families and is not going to do what uh, some of the opponents have, that have labeled this the kidnapping bill is seeking to do. 
but Minnesota families meet this clause under 518D on, these two, on this two-part test. You are present in the state of Minnesota, which all Minnesota children and families are, and number two, the child is unable to obtain gender-affirming health care. That will then give the court not temporary jurisdiction, temporary emergency jurisdiction to come in and remove the child from the custody of the parents, put them into a CHIPS case, and send the family through the difficult cycle uh, that the child protection system is, which I have dealt with uh, a number of families, uh, even in my work here, that have ended up uh, in CPS cases. And Mr. President, it is very difficult. If there is legitimate wrongdoing and abuse, which there are many cases where there is, there is that fact, it is a terrible, terrible thing for that family. I've also dealt with cases where there is a wrong assumption made, where a wrong belief was held that a family was doing something wrong to the child, and afterwards it was determined that that had not actually occurred. But even getting roped into that CHIPS case and the child protection system is very, very difficult and damaging to a family even when wrongdoing has not occurred. I worked with one case where it took over a year for a family to get custody of their children back over something that ultimately had, was shown that there was no credible wrongdoing by the parents in the first place. Members, we definitely need to adopt the Abler Amendment. I don't doubt the sincerity of the positions that you're holding, but the language that's in the bill before you is saying something opposite. This does not belong in the Section 518D section of statute that is right here, because it will line up with all these other areas that bring, uh, that give courts the temporary emergency jurisdiction that this bill is trying to propose. I urge members to support the A50 amendment. Senator, uh, Senator a Aaron McQuaid. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, members, first, uh, Mr. President, I would suggest members who talked to lawyers about this and got that information report those lawyers to the bar. Um, this is not at all what the bill does, and I'm very, very happy to clear up the misinformation. First part, 518D of our statutory code deals with interstate custody cases. 260C is where Minnesota cases are located. I think you know that, Mr. President, you're an attorney. Um, so this has nothing to do with Minnesota cases. And section three of this bill talks about the emergency jurisdiction of a custody case. Not a child, not a family, the case. Mr. President, I'm gonna ask you to think of 518D.204 as an ER, an emergency room for custody cases, if you will. Because if a custody case should arise and we're not immediately sure, does another state already have a custody case in that state? We'll hold on to it until we figure that out. And then if they don't, then Minnesota could be an appropriate forum for the court to hear that custody case at which point they would use all the regular criteria to determine the best interest of the child, none of which has changed in this bill. So again, members, I'm gonna urge you to vote way no on this amendment because all this does is allow custody cases that aren't immediately identifiable as being in another state to be temporarily in the jurisdiction of a Minnesota court, the custody case to be temporarily in the jurisdiction of the Minnesota court until they find out where it goes. It's actually the least important part of this bill. Important, but probably least important. It does not much. So, Mr. President, I'm gonna ask uh, members to vote no on this, and I'm gonna ask members who talk to lawyers to talk to those lawyers and make sure they have brushed up on their law, and please vote no. Senator Abler, you're the author. Thank if you. my memory serves me correctly. Uh, you are the author, so you get the last word before we vote. Thank you, Mr. President, and I hope that I'm persuasive. 
Uh, Mr. President, this is the very reason I requested a Rule 21 motion and that this would be discussed in a committee where we could have people actually come and tell us what this bill does. So my six experts, none of whom know each other, none of whom were coached on the answers that um, I asked them to give, uh, they agreed. And so if we're going to parse the law, then we should look at the law. And I actually, I've got the whole 518D in front of me. I'm not going to read it, Mr. President. Um, but it says, uh, a child, child we're talking about here, a child means an individual who has not yet attained 18 years of age. It doesn't say a child from some other state. It doesn't say a child except for Minnesota. It says that, that they're a certain age. And, and then the jurisdiction, it says uh, on line A, on, well, I, I don't have the lines in the law, but it says the child's present in this state. And um, so, Mr. President, I am clearly not a lawyer. Um, I read a lot of law, and I've actually written law, and I attempt to understand it. I attempt to go to people who do know it. And three judges and two attorneys who specialize in this work said, this is a problem. And I wish Senator Mitchell were true, um, but the Court of Emergency Jurisdiction supersedes the regular courts. And my concern you can discuss are they going to be taken away, and I didn't even use the K word, Mr. President, in my talk. But so there is every reasonable th belief that a, a situation where a coach or a social worker or a, a doctor says, oh, this person needs this, they become a reporter of some kind, and a case develops if they make a complaint, and that complaint is now going to be elevated to this court. And so even if it's dismissed, that family now has just been minding their own business in Minnesota. They've never been to Texas, and they're just living their lives. And this is going to happen to them, and I, it's, it's not untrue. And I, I, I hope when this happens, they're going to listen to the two senators who say, oh, that's not what we meant. But Mr. President, when courts go to, you know this, they look at the words. They're not going to go, like, oh, what, are, what Senator Abler thought about this? I don't think they're going to look at that. Um, so, Mr. President, this, this does no harm to the bill. The bill works perfectly to accomplish the purposes of the, uh, of the authors. And the Hippocratic Oath, probably in law, too, I don't know, do they have one of those? Above all, do no harm. Let's not subject people to harm in the name of protecting other people from harm. Mr. President and members, I urge a green vote. The secretary will take the roll on the A50 amendment. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. Senator Coran votes aye. Senator Coran votes aye. And Senator Weber votes aye. And Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Friends, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There, have been, there being 30 ayes and 33 noes, the A50 amendment is not adopted.
Any further amendments? Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, thanks for the discussion. I do uh, would like to say initially that I know uh, the author of the bill, Senator McQuay, says it does a lot of harm to minor children if they're not allowed to trans uh, transition. And I have a report from the Institute of, for Research and Evaluation that documents a dozen of peer-reviewed studies on the harm it does to minor children and, uh, and why it's not good for minor children to be going through this process until they've uh, at least mentally developed where they weigh, could weigh the consequences of it. I'm glad to provide a copy to anybody who's interested. But just a couple opening comments before I introduce the amendment. Um, you know, in regards to children, we see that a lot of these, the gender-affirming care, so-called, it affects, you know, the surgery affects bodies, uh, some of the drugs, the cross-sex hormones, the uh, puberty blockers, they uh, cause sterilization. Uh, and again, the surgery mutilates the child, uh, at the minor child. And a lot of this is irreversible. In addition to this, these drugs that they use, there's a loss of speed processing and memory, loss of bone density and stunted growth. And these are minor children uh, members. There's sterility and loss of sex function, increase of heart attacks uh, and strokes, and pulmonary embolisms, worsen mental health conditions. So members, uh, applying gender, uh, so-called gender affirming health care to minors creates harm on the children, not helps them. You know, a lot of them suffer from what, what was known as gender dysphoria by the psychological uh, profession. And almost all of them grow out of it eventually, if they're not indoctrinated that they should go through this. And across this country, and even the world, more and more countries and states are recognizing and wanting to pass laws to protect minor children from going through the abuse of gender-affirming health care. So with that, Mr. President, I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Grudenhagen offers the A4 amendment. The Secretary will report the A4 amendment. Senator Grunhagen moves to amend House File 146 as follows. Page 5 after line 28, insert. This is amendment A-4. Senator Grudenhagen to your A4 amendment. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, and members, what this does, it basically excludes uh, the mutilating surgery, the uh, uh, puberty blockers, and the cross-sex hormones from minor children, those under 18. And members, they don't even have the ability to weigh the consequences mentally of what they're doing, and yet this process, much of it has irreversible consequences. Uh, secondly, um, the gender dysphoria can be treated in these children. And again, I reference the studies that I, I mentioned before from the Institute of Research and Evaluation, if you want to double check that. You know, we restrict access to certain things in our society for minor children. And that's a good reason, because we want to keep them from harm. So here especially, when they're under 18 and they're minors, we should be protecting them from some of the devastating consequences of going through the so-called gender-affirming health care. That is not hate. That, to me, is love. And I know everyone here that serves, and even the staff, care about the children. So let's do what's right and protect them until they get at an age where they can properly weigh the consequences. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like a roll call. Roll call request or roll call granted. Senator Bowden? Senator McQuay? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, I'm going to ask you to vote no. Um, 
because I was wrong. Um, you know, trans kids, trans adults, trans people are not mutilated. They are whole people, worthy of respect and dignity from this chamber and all people. The obsession with their bodies and their genitals is weird and creepy, especially children. I'd really appreciate it if we didn't have to talk about it that much, but here we are. First thing I'll say, wait and see has devastating effects for people over 18. The second thing I'll say is gender affirming care is developmentally appropriate care that is determined with a parent, the provider, and the child. It often involves things like talk therapy, growing your hair out, wearing clothes that fit your gender identity and your gender expression. This amendment would have devastating consequences. There is a mental health professional, actually, I'm gonna amend because she's literally a suicide prevention specialist in North Dakota who treated a young child. And he actually said to her, when she asked why he attempted suicide, my state doesn't want me. That is what children hear when we do things like this. So obviously I'm a no vote because this undoes the entire point of the bill. And I want to just shout some joy into the world for trans kids. I had some parents with trans kids send me some things that they're really proud of their kids for. Max is an animal-loving eight-year-old. He's someone's transgender son, and he's really looking forward to warmer weather so he can put rollerblades on and practice his hockey skills. Nora has been taking sewing classes for four years, and she's teaching her friends how to sew as well. Hildy was Olaf in her middle school musical. Asher, your parents are so proud of you and can't wait to play Pokemon with you tonight. These are children we're talking about. These are parents' children we're talking about. Their health care, the health care that they decide to have, is none of our business. It doesn't matter what we think about the health care, although I can tell you, it saves their lives. And I want them alive. I love them. They're amazing. I'm so glad they're here. But it doesn't really matter what we think about it. Their doctors, the medical associations, the parents say this is appropriate care. And that is enough for me. This amendment would increase the risk of suicide and depression astronomically for trans youth. So members, I'm going to ask you to vote no. I'm going to ask us to stop talking about kids' genitals. And let's pass this bill so trans kids and their parents know that they are safe, beloved, and welcomed in this state. Thank you. Any other discussion before I go to the author of the amendment who gets the last word? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. I think it's appropriate for us to consider this particular amendment dealing with minor children, minor children who uh, believe that they are something that is not represented in their physical construct. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about the maturity of a brain, the development of a brain in a young person, young adult. Science has given us clear direction that Individuals with that uh, lack of physical and mental acuity, not acuity, but maturity, often cannot make decisions that have consequential results. Uh, just recently, county attorney uh, in Hennepin County justified a minor criminal sentence for two teenagers they committed a ghastly murder. Only two years that would be spent. Uh, and she claimed that their mental maturity had not developed enough in order to justify having such a serious criminal sanction. That case is in dispute right now. Attorney General Ellison has taken over that case and is seeking uh, a more serious sanction. Just the other day in the Judiciary Committee, 
we talked about juvenile life without release. A prison sentence, a life sentence without release, we were reacting to a Supreme Court decision, the Miller case, where they're saying that juveniles do not have the mental maturity to understand the serious nature of the crime that they would commit to justify a life sentence. Senator Latz said, and I may quote, physiologically the brain simply does not fully develop until age 25 or depending on who you listen to, age 28. That's just the science. This is Senator Latz speaking. Teenagers are notoriously short on the ability to consider consequences of their behavior. Anyone who's raised a teenager knows that. And short on their ability to interpret the impulses to do things that are not appropriate conduct. They don't have the physical, the neurological capacity to do that as well as an adult does. Because the brain just hasn't developed those capacities yet. Not to mention the fact that they're off for undergoing puberty and have hormones that are raging and so on, unquote. We've used this logic to justify a great number of public policies in the last few years. But somehow, we want to ignore those same scientific conclusions in debates such as this. I think this amendment is appropriate. I think it's appropriate to understand the mind, the maturity level of young people. And quite honestly, this time I think science is giving us the direct path to consider and that this type of alteration to one's body should be restricted to those who are minor age. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. I think the argument here truly undermines the fact that our children are intelligent beings that know themselves. This is not some rash decision where kids might do something impetuously. These are children who, if they are in a space, safe space in their family, start talking to their parents about this when they're four, five, six years old. I have a friend whose son transitioned. They've known since he was little. And it's more effective if they can start that transition in the teenage years. But this was an evolving conversation between a parent, a child, and doctors over years. This isn't the rash decision that we're talking about when we're talking about why we have to wait for some decisions with children. And I would also remind that there are decisions that we do let our teens make. I was allowed to go into the military when I was 17. That's when I signed the paperwork, to be in the military. Kids can get guns the second they turn 18. Many states have provisions where, where children as, as young as 14 can get married for the rest of their life, possibly, in certain situations. These are not rash decisions they are going to regret for the rest of their lives. These are decisions that are thought out in the context of a family environment for years. And as Senator Mayquaid said, that is not our business. That is between the child, the family, and the doctor. And if the doctor recommends it and isn't worried about all these things that are mm, not really realistic, then we should not be either. We should let this be a private matter. 
Senator Letts. Uh, Mr. President and members, uh, I just rise to respond to Senator Limmer's comment, uh, accurately quoting me about uh, the science of brain development, in particular that science uh, does apply to the prefrontal cortex, which as Senator Mitchell, Mitchell alluded to, um, is the part of the brain that governs impulse control. Um, as uh, she said, this is, these are not rash decisions. These are uh, evolving conversations. They are thoughtful decisions. Um, and uh, while I would like to follow the science, I think we ought to follow the science here too. Uh, so if we want to, uh, uh, it's really not accurate to start applying prefrontal cortex brain development science to decisions like gender affirming care. Uh, so I just want to clarify my remarks um, in, in that regard and, and what I was referring to. Uh, it is more accurate to apply it to much more common criminal conduct, which is often a function of, of uh, lack of impulse control or understanding of, uh, of those kinds of consequences. Uh, so I just want to lay that for the record. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibbo. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, members, I would encourage a no vote on this amendment. Um, to listen to the proponents of the amendment, um, the, uh, the underlying premise, of course, is that um, there is something uh, mistaken and something wrong with uh, acknowledging and recognizing uh, uh, gender affirming care and the need for young people. Uh, to be under the care in conjunction with their parents and their medical providers and receiving this kind of care um, and it's pathologizing them and um, talking about uh, gender affirming care is fraught with problems. It's not uh, members. And just a, a little bit of information uh, for those who might uh, be curious. Um, the most recent data we have on kids suggests that after uh, five years of social transition, 100% of kids who reach uh, age 10 uh, without wavering their identity, uh, don't, quote, unquote, change their minds. And also, uh, on the subject of puberty blockers, uh, Mr. President, they're used for a variety of reasons, uh, including uh, what we would call cisgender kids. And to ban them from, for only in this circumstance is simply an act of discrimination. Um, so uh, if, if we're having such problems, why wouldn't we just ban them outright? Of course, um, we're targeting one particular community and one particular group of people who we've deemed to be uh, either non-existent or unworthy. So, uh, Mr. President, I think the very foundation and premise and underlying proposition of this amendment is flawed and would encourage a no vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator McQuaid, did you have anything to say or are you okay? All right, I'm going down to the uh, bill, excuse me, the author of the amendment will be the last voice that you'll hear before we go to vote on this amendment. Before you say anything, Senator Jaskowski is standing there, Senator Grudenhagen. Senator Jaskowski, I said Senator Jaskowski, and then it will be you, Senator Grunhagen. Thank Senator, you, Mr. Uh, President. Thank you. Um, well, members, I appreciate the discussion, and um, I hear the discussion about a rash decision, and members, I read the bill, and the bill in terms of policy for our state, I believe, is a rash decision. We are more and more creating ourselves to be an island, an island state, that is, in this case, a sanctuary state of, of some uh, component. There's, uh, there's bills that are put together for a sanctuary state for illegal aliens. We heard a bill earlier that uh, creates a sanctuary state for abortion. Members, if our state is not working with the states around us, we're running aground. This alone is a rash decision. I wonder about the thought behind it and what this will mean for our state's future. Interfering with parents and their kids is a rash decision. And that's exactly what this bill aims to do. Provide for interference between parent parents and their kids in the parental authority that God created and intended. It's our job to protect that authority and not bring a rash decision to interfere with it, members. 
That's what, that, that's what this bill does. I encourage you to vote against the bill when we get there. But, Mr. President, in terms of the amendment, um, I think uh, Senator Gruenhagen brings some very reasonable things for us in the construct of this very rash decision of a bill to put into it some reasonable uh, protections for kids and for their families that we can provide some protection from the Democrats in their rash decision that is not in the best interest of our state. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President and members. To the good Senator from Mazeppa, I would just say thank you for using the word sanctuary. And I'd encourage every member in this chamber to look up what does sanctuary mean and ask yourself, do we mean that in a good way or a bad way? It's a good way. It's always been a good way. It's going to remain a good way, and we're going to send this bill off the floor into law. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Grunhagen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, thanks for the good discussion. I think uh, we need to think carefully uh, before we vote. But just a couple things. Again, uh, the Institute of Research and Evaluation has compiled dozens of study that refutes a lot of the allegations that have been made in terms of uh, uh, the, the negative consequences of, of doing uh, gender-affirming care to children. I'd encourage you to reference that because uh, they're based, they're peer-reviewed and medical science. Secondly, I have an article here from a lady who was a case manager at one of the largest uh, uh, gender trans transitioning uh, uh, clinics. After four years, she couldn't take it anymore. She left the clinic because of what they were doing to the children. I encourage you to read that letter. It's on the internet. Finally, members, one of the excellent resources I find in terms of uh, one of the reasons I brought this forward is go on to Twitter and follow uh, Gays Against groomers. And what they are is a group of homosexuals who oppose doing gender-affirming surgery to children. You'll find there's uh, professionals on there, but you'll also find people who had gender-affirming care as a minor, and now as, a, as they grow up and become an adult, they are detransitioning. And some of them are suing the medical facilities that did this to them. So again, members, you cannot change your biology, and no amount of uh, surgery can do that, and it simply uh, mutilates these children. So please vote for this amendment and protect the children. Thank you, members. Thank the you. secretary would take the roll on the A4 amendment. Senator Friends, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dedzik votes no. Excuse Senator Dedzik yeah, votes no. no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Hochschild votes no. Senator Hochschild votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Sen Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Jasinski votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Weber votes aye. And Senator Weber votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 29 ayes and 34 noes. The A4 amendment is not adopted. <coughs> Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. President. I impose a call of the Senate. The Senate is now under call.
Senator McWay. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I. You have to move in order to 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 oh, lift the call. I will wait, Mr. President. Thanks so much. I'll find out. And Senator McQuaid, will this be for the duration of the bill or just for, uh, oh, what's your pleasure? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to introduce an amendment, so just throughout the duration of the amendment. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. This is the first time I've done this. May I continue on? No, you have to. Um, there's some language that you have to give us around. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. Now, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I will offer the A1 amendment. Senator May Quaid offers the A1 amendment. The secretary will report the A1 amendment. Senator May Quaid moves to amend House File Number 146 as follows. Page 5 after line 6, insert. This is the A1 amendment. Senator May Quaid to your A1 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, one of the things that was so bewildering to me was to get emails from concerned constituents that my bill was a kidnapping bill. And I was really, really confused because there have actually been kidnapping bills introduced in other state legislatures to take trans children from their parents, to take children from trans parents, or to take children who have trans ch uh, siblings. And so, uh, Mr. President, I took word for word the Florida kidnapping bill, the actual Florida kidnapping bill, so members could see what an actual kidnapping bill looks like. I'm going to read a little bit to you. Instead of emergency jurisdiction of a custody case, which is what my bill does, an actual kidnapping bill that was introduced by Florida Republicans under the section warrant to take physical custody of a child have included if a child is in danger of serious physical harm and they've added that access to gender affirming care is serious physical harm. Additionally, the Florida Republicans amended the full faith and credit clause to say that a court of Florida has jurisdiction to vacate, stay, or modify a child custody determination of a court of another state if the parent or guardian allows the child to access gender affirming care. And then the court must vacate, stay, or modify the child custody determination to prevent a parent from allowing a child to access gender-affirming care. Now, Mr. President, I'm going to encourage everybody to vote no on this, but since anti-LGBTQ hate groups are actually having legislators across the country introduce real kidnapping bills that would actually take trans kids from their loving parents, that would investigate them for child abuse, that would take kids from their trans parents, or take kids who have trans siblings from their loving homes, I thought everyone should have the opportunity to vote on it. So that is what my amendment does. If folks want to know what an actual kidnapping bill looks like, this is it. I'm going to encourage my members to vote no. Y'all can do what you want. Any further discussion on the A1 amendment? Senator Dibble. Mr. President, I'd like to request a roll call on the A1. Roll call request a roll call granted. Any additional discussion on the A1? Senator um, Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, read the A1 carefully. It cuts to the heart of the matter. It cuts to the exact reason why we have Senator Mayquade's bill in front of us today. Members, there is legislation being introduced throughout this country, several hundred bills that would lament, would do the very thing that Senator Gruskowski lamented just a few minutes ago, which is to grievously interfere in people's parents' ability to take care of their children. The state would insert itself into the medical care, into the parental decisions, into the ability for parents 
to take care of their kids. Take those children away from them. Reach into, take their laws and reach into other states like the state of Minnesota, should they become a refugee within their own country. This amendment cuts right to the heart of the stakes and cuts right to the heart of what this bill is about and the values that Senator McQuaid is trying to uphold that we know to be true about Minnesota. So you have this opportunity right now uh, to show Minnesotans and show the rest of the country where you stand. You either stand with all those laws that we see in places like Texas and Missouri and Tennessee, Florida, or you stand up for the values that Minnesota holds dear. We care for all kids. We care for parents. We care for the decisions they make for what is best for them. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm trying to determine what this amendment really does. I'm reading it. The new language states, a court of this state, once again, we're directing the courts again, a different branch of government to do something. The court of this state has jurisdiction to vacate, stay, or modify a child custody determination of a court of another state if the parent or guardian allows child access gender-affirming care. Uh, when, when do we ever ask, or not ask, order another jurisdiction to modify, stay, or vacate a, a determination of a court of another state? Could someone explain that to me? I, I don't know of any ex example where we in, the, in Minnesota would demand that from a court in this state to vacate, stay, or modify a decision of a court of another state. Uh, is this even constitutional to do? I put that to the body, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Senator Limmer, are you asking someone to yield for a question? Because as you know, we, um, um, unless you are done talking, then I could go on to someone else. I just don't want to uh, take the floor away from you if it's inappropriate. Well, Mr. President, until you asked, I, I was done talking. Uh, but uh, I'm asking perhaps a rhetorical question. When do we vacate and demand, demand that from the legislative branch of government, we demand a judicial branch of government to do something and to vacate a decision by another state. Uh, I've never heard of it before, but you know, I'm a simple guy, I don't get out a lot. But nevertheless, can someone in this body tell me, have we ever done this before? And then the question would be, why? Senator Pappas, you had your hand up. Uh, Mr. President, I'm not answering that question. Okay, I have a different well, issue. Th uh, thank you. I, I, is there anyone who wants to answer this question? Senator Dibble. Uh, well, Mr. President, um, Senator Limmer asks the essential question. It's a great reason to vote no on this amendment. This should not happen. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Mitchell, you're holding your hand up. Thank you, Mr. President. As I mentioned, I do have a law degree, and I've done a lot of uh, work as an advocate voluntarily in the family court system, um, states absolutely can modify custody orders. It happens all the time. One parent moves to another state. Uh, that is now what might be in the best interest of the child to be in the new state. The new state would take jurisdiction. The order would be modified. Um, if this, the newer state is considered the most convenient forum for everyone, um, if everyone has moved from the original state, so let's say everyone started in Florida and now someone moved to Georgia and someone moved to Alabama, one of those two states has to take over the custody agreement and has to take over the jurisdiction. So we change jurisdictions of custody arrangements all the time. So there would be no problem 
if someone is trying to uh, vote against this and just say, well, you know, I wouldn't have voted for this, but, but I, I have some legal concerns. There shouldn't be a legal concern here. So there should be a conscience vote on this. Thank you, Mr. President. So we are now moving from the question, and I'm going back to my list. Um, uh, Senator Pappas. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator McQuaid yield? Senator McQuaid, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. I believe you, um, you mentioned in your comments that this, um, this amendment was being introduced as bills in other states. Has this amendment been also introduced in the state of Minnesota as a standalone bill? Uh, Senator McQuaid. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, what I would tell Senator Pappas is, to my knowledge, this exact language has not, but the, this is part of a larger bill in the state of Florida that was introduced that bans gender-affirming care that has been introduced in the Minnesota legislature. Senator Pappas, you have no other questions. I wanted to make sure I'm not being rude. Uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. I was actually going to ask a similar question uh, because I do not believe that this language has been uh, introduced by anyone in this body. Uh, I am planning uh, to vote no on this amendment. Uh, we know what the reason is behind all of these moves to uh, place a call of the Senate and, and uh, have it for this amendment and bring this up that's come from a different state and then uh, force everyone to vote on it, and I'm not participating in that. Uh, I would also say, though, Mr. President, that it does not address the underlying issue. There can be multiple ways that have a law that exercises custody jurisdiction over Minnesota families. And so you can show us an extreme example like this that has come from other states and have us all vote no on it, which I am planning to do but it does not address the underlying issue of what is actually in this bill that we have had debate over, that where the words of the proponents of this bill do not match the language that is included in this bill. And so the point still stands about the worries of families with what uh, the state will have the authority to do uh, over their families, but just because you vote against an extremist version like this does not mean that there are other avenues uh, already included in the bill uh, that are concerning. So with that, members, I encourage a no vote. Senator Caroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Would the uh, author of the amendment yield for a uh, question? Senator McQuaid, will you yield? She will yield. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator McQuaid. Um, do you believe that your amendment violates the uh, full faith and credit clause of the United States Constitution. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just so everyone's very clear, uh, this language was taken verbatim from a law introduced in Florida. They amended the full faith and credit clause of their statute. However, my understanding is that full faith and credit really applies to money, um, and so I guess, I mean, I'm not a constitutional judge or lawyer. Um, my understanding is probably not. That's my guess, Mr. President. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. So um, the way I'm reading this amendment, um, the court of this state has the jurisdiction to vacate, stay, or modify the court order of another state and choose not to honor it. Obviously, that has serious uh, constitutional concerns. And um, you know, I think before we would be voting, I know that, um, well, before we should vote on any kind of bill or an amendment um, that has not been through committee um, and properly vetted and has constitutional concerns, I don't think we should be eager to jump on that. Um, so for those reasons, I, I don't know how we could vote yes on an amendment that likely violates the Constitution. Any additional discussions on the A1 amendment? Senator Mitchell. 
Mr. President, I just want to give a clarification because there was a question about the law that I feel that I can be informative in. Uh, the full faith and credit is the requirement derived from Article 4, Section 1 of the Constitution that basically is a general framework for states honoring each other's laws um, so that they can kind of know what to expect if someone's traveling from state to state. This is not violated in any way, shape, or form because as I already mentioned that if one of the parties in a child custody has already availed themselves of the state of Minnesota, we already have Minnesota uh, situations where if one parent has moved here or both, both parents have, have moved from different states that have the jurisdiction, no one lives in that state anymore, that uh, jurisdiction can easily change in a child custody agreement. So for this, there is no full faith and credit concern whatsoever. So again, this provision has no legal concerns and any vote on this would purely be a vote on conscience. Any additional questions before the roll? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't see anything, obviously this has not been vetted. I don't see anything that would require um, the parents to be here in order for this to, uh, this amendment to go into effect. So with all due respect, you may not think it has any constitutional concerns, um, but I respectfully disagree with your analysis. Senator McQuay, being the author of the amendment, you will be the last voice before we vote on the A1 amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so again, I want to be really clear. My bill, my bill, briefly touches on the emergency jurisdiction for a child custody case. It does not say what the determination of the best interest of the child is. It just says Minnesota courts are going to hold this case while we figure out what state actually has it? In the same section of law, 518D, it does deal with the physical custody of a child, and it's in this amendment. So if somebody was going to write a, a, a law, a bill, to kidnap a child, they would have to amend this section, which is the exact session my Republican friends in Florida did. And so I really wanted to put on the record what a real kidnapping bill would look like. I wanted people to see exactly what the language would have to look like in order to take a child from their parents related to gender affirming care. And thank you so much to the Republicans of Florida for writing it for me. I literally copied and pasted it because a lot of the custody language is almost identical state to state to state to state. The numbers were different, but the language is identical. Made it very easy for me. So, again, I'm gonna encourage members to vote no, because this is heinous, and this is the stuff that's happening in other states. This is what kidnapping actually looks like. My bill creates a refuge for trans children and their families in this state. My bill creates a refuge for providers in this state. My bill makes sure that Minnesota continues to be a beacon of care, compassion, and personal freedom. Please vote no on this amendment. The secretary will take the roll on the A1 amendment. Senator French, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Hoschild votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. Senator Muhammad votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. And Senator Rest votes no. S
Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Westrom votes no. Senator Westrom votes no. And Senator Weber votes no. And Senator Weber votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been zero ayes and 62 noes. The A1 amendment is not adopted. Any additional um, amendments? Any additional amendments? If none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 146, a bill for an act relating to children, preventing the use of subpoenas to gather information for out-of-state laws, interfering in the use of gender-affirming health care. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President, and to members of the other body who have stopped over here. I, uh, always good to have people from across the street. And this has uh, been quite a good discussion. Um, I still remain concerned about uh, the Section 3, which uh, the Senate's made a decision on, Mr. President, so I'm not going to raise that concern anymore. Um, I've actually uh, have been doing a lot of research, um, and I appreciate the comments here, um, but I don't think that the science is as solid as you think um, on this, and I think some of the decisions to move into this uh, arena of, of health care are... Um, are not uh, as thought through as they might be. I'm sure for some individuals, this is the culmination of years of, of thought and prayer and family engagement. Um, but as I talk to others who are in this industry, uh, it is um, not always so. And so um, that's, I just got a few thoughts based upon a bunch of articles from across the world. Um, the, uh, in Sweden, there's a, an article from uh, just April that says um, evidence to assess the effects of hormone treatment on the on children with uh, are insufficient. Um, that's a whole group of doctors that wrote that. Sweden, Europe is quite a ways ahead of us, Mr. President, and so they actually they uh, they know uh, quite a bit. The Swedish National Board of Health um, suggests that um, the need they suggested. Um, just last December, that the need for good clinical studies is clear from the knowledge gaps. Uh, and so uh, follow-up and evaluation was something we emphasized in 2015, and since then, very little knowledge has been added. And um, that's concerning to me. Um, and then they also commented um, the uncertain state of knowledge um, about uh, hormone therapy and, uh, and uh, breast surgery uh, for minors, uh, it's, uh, except in exceptional cases, they didn't suggest that. Um, the, uh, and there's just a, a bunch of these um, that, that suggest that we really don't know what we need. And with respect to the people who have said the AMA and the American Psychological Association and the American Association of Pediatrics are uh, totally squared away, an article from, uh, from Finland um, suggests that uh, the American medical establishment is out of step with its European counterparts. Um, and that's um, interesting to me. And, and there's just, I'm not going to, I don't have a, like a long speech here, but I, it's, Mr. President, um, the science is not all the way figured out on this. And uh, that's something that should be very important. Uh, in Sweden, they did a cohort study of people who had um, some of these procedures over the last 30 years. And they discovered that it wasn't uh, fun and it wasn't, what did somebody else say? Um, I can't find everything. But anyway, that, um, and it, being trans is the best. Um, that just implies that it's, it's kind of like, for some individuals, they're not thinking it through and, and they're not always encouraged. 
to think it through. And that is the, the, the main point of my thoughts here. Um, and so, you know, we talked about, oh, in fact, on that Finland study, they talked about suicide. Um, I can find it here. And according to Finland, and this person who's done this work for well over a decade, um, they said there's no evidence that the elevated risk of suicide is because of unaffirmed gender identity or that social transition or medical transition will reduce their risk for self-harm. Um, and because that's what we're all concerned about. Oh, what if we, what, what if we don't do, you know, just do this right away that, and, and I'm, tragically, I'm sure there are some who have done that, but uh, these are people who have spent a good deal of time working on this. And so my point that I'm just trying to make is, you know, I wish Section 3 would have come out, then the bill would have been less problematic for people just living their lives. Um, but, but there are consequences. And according to a study in uh, the Endocrine Society with a bunch of um, really smart doctors, um, they, they talked about that the health consequences of therapy are, can be highly detrimental. Um, the stated quality of evidence in the guidelines is low, and the diagnostic certainty is, is poor. Um, and it's, they also said that limited long-term outcome data um, failed to demonstrate long-term success in suicide prevention. And so, um, at the end of the day, Mr. President, this is something that people, as they in engage in this, um, I, I'm not in any way opposed to whatever this, uh, you know, to do what people decide they're going to do. That's not why I'm here at all. But it, there's a sense that this is like the greatest thing ever. And it's, for some people it is the greatest thing. For some people it's a road if they just sat tight, according to one of these writers, that a, a good number of the individuals, like the majority, We'll, we'll write it out and not come to harm. Um, there's this one more study I want to cite for you. Um, and so people that have done this, that have since 20 years into this, oh, I can't find it. Um, oh, I'm sorry, but oh, here it is. Um, suicide, we talk about that as a concern 20 times, according to the study from... I believe in Sweden, over time, um, hospitalizations due to psychiatric reasons four times, substance use three times, suicide attempts six times. And just so that people go into this with their eyes open is my, my concern. And because um, I don't think we always are, and I think there are some individuals, in the case of these pre-teens, who face these uh, situations. And we talked in the marijuana discussion about how I tried to get it to 25. Um, and as you go forward into life-changing circumstances, I think the Minnesota, I think the American medical group needs to catch up with what Finland and Sweden and the Netherlands have learned and add that into the mix. And those are my comments. And I, I hope that in all that, people see that I appreciate Individuals that find themselves uh, desiring all this and the families, and um, I'm sensitive to that, but just uh, we need to improve our work here, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, going back to the last amendment, Oh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. Um, the full faith and credit clause of the United States Constitution requires states in the union to recognize and accept other states' public records, judicial proceedings, and legislative acts. It's not just about money. It's what makes us a union. We are not 50 independent nations. We are one nation comprised of 50 separate states. Each state has its own executive, legislative and judicial branch. Each state sets its own laws and operates its own court system. 
And in return, each state accepts the right of the other states to set its own laws and operate its own court system. The full faith and credit clause of the Constitution unites us as a country while allowing states to keep some of their own autonomy. And one of the primary purposes of the full faith and credit clause is to recognize and enforce judgments rendered in our sister court states, our sister state courts, sorry, to prevent individuals from moving to another state to avoid a court judgment. Yet that is precisely what this bill does. This bill proposes that Minnesota, as one of 50 states, will not honor the laws and judicial proceedings of another state. This type of bill is reckless and unconstitutional. It, put, it puts Minnesota squarely in the middle of family custody disputes in other states. The way the bill is sometimes described is its, its parents coming to Minnesota to seek this type of care, this gender affirming care is what it's called, and uh, we're just protecting them from the consequences of that in their home state. But in reality, what this is going to be involving more of will be in custody disputes where uh, the parents maybe don't agree, and one parent uh, wants to this type of care and the other parent doesn't. Or, quite frankly, the bill doesn't even require a parent to be with the child in order to invoke the protections um, of the jurisdictions of the court in this state. They could be here uh, as a runaway or with uh, some other individual. Um, this bill is the state of Minnesota telling the rest of the country that we aren't going to honor your laws or your court orders if we don't like them. And that's not how this country works. Our country can't work that way. If states stop recognizing the other states' laws, we cease to exist as the United States. And that is precisely why the full faith and credit clause is in the U.S. Constitution and why this law violates the U.S. Constitution. And as I said on the previous bill, I'll reiterate it here, the, there's, there's problems with the extradition clause of the United States Constitution as well. And I won't go into detail onto that, but if somebody's charged with a crime in one state and they come to this state, the governor of this state, or the governor of the state in which the crime was committed can request the return of that person and the other state must comply. And again, with the full faith and credit clause, if Minnesota starts doing that, if we say we're not going to enforce court judgments, we're not going to enforce laws from other states because we don't like them, there's nothing stopping other states from recipro reciprocating. And they may not like the, the laws that we here in Minnesota are passing. And they may say, we're not going to enforce your laws. We're not going to enforce uh, your court orders. And quite frankly, our country simply can't operate that way. Um, this is a irresponsible and unconstitutional bill. Um, and it is our duty to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McQuaid, for bringing this bill today. And I'd like to thank our guests who are visiting with us here in the chamber and those who may be watching, but especially to my dear trans friends, to my friends with trans kids, and to all of our trans neighbors and loved ones, I love you. And I care deeply about your happiness and your well-being. And I want you to know that here in these halls of government, there are many people advocating today and every day for your ability to live your life free from discrimination, free from hate, free from impediments and scorn, free to love and be safe, exactly as you are every single day. The bill before us today has been represented in many ways um, that I think are inaccurate, but let's just get down to the facts here. I am a family law attorney in my real life. 
my other life, my real life, my other life. And what this bill does is it, it, it talks about jurisdiction to hear a case. This happens on a regular basis in family law cases, in custody cases. What court can exercise initial jurisdiction for child custody matters? And when can a court exercise continuing jurisdiction? And what this bill says is that we're going to amend Minnesota's version of the UCCJEA, which is the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act. We're going we're to amend that to include that if no other court of any other state would have jurisdiction over a child custody matter, the presence of the child in this state for the purpose of obtaining gender-affirming health care is sufficient to meet the requirements for initial jurisdiction. That's all it is. Doesn't say what's going to happen. As Senator McQuaid said over and over again, it is not a custody determination. It's just deciding what forum is going to hear the case. And in Minnesota, as with any other state, there's a whole bunch of best interests of the child factors that are going to that the court will examine to determine who should have custody of this child. But what we are saying is that there is a circumstance under which a child uh, and parent can seek a custody determination or seek jurisdiction for custody determination in the state. This, this bill also states that here in Minnesota, we value all people. We value our trans brothers and sisters, siblings, sorry, siblings, neighbors, kids, parents. And we're saying that our principles and our values will be brought to bear to protect those who find themselves in our borders. And I'm glad we have so many constitutional scholars in the body, but I would simply say that if somebody's going to determine the constitutionality of a statute, I think we can allow the courts to do that. There's nothing unusual about the language in this bill. Shouldn't be unusual. I ask for everyone to support Senator May Quaid's bill, but more importantly, again, to support our beloved neighbors who simply want to live their life. Thank you. Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a good day in the Minnesota Senate. I want to thank Senator May Quaid for her work on this bill and bringing this forward. As I serve in this body, in this beautiful chamber, every time I push the buttons on my desk, I feel the weight of the responsibility of this role. And as I very soon push my green button for this bill, I will also feel a sense of joy and hope and gratitude. It was mentioned before that Minnesota is becoming a sanctuary and an island. And in many ways, that's true. And we should be very proud of that. It's a sanctuary and an island for compassion and care and love. A sanctuary and an island of safety and acceptance. And so as we all push our buttons today, this is a chance for us to stand in our values as Minnesotans. This is who we are. This is a place we can say, Minnesota is a place where all of our neighbors, all of them, are loved and they belong and they are valued and accepted just as they are. So I encourage everyone to vote green. Senator Kupik. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, you and I have not had the uh, pleasure to serve on a committee together. Uh, if we had had that pleasure, you would be you would get the uh, pleasure or maybe the unpleasantness of sitting next to me and hearing a dad joke. So because we have not had that, I'd like to go with a dad joke uh, right now. So I would say, why does a cow have hooves? Because it lacks toes. That's why. And 
Thank you. So my wish is that for all kids, and especially transgender kids, the thing that they had to worry the most about would be a parent like me telling a stupid joke like that. But that is not the life they have to lead. It is the things that they have to go through, the terrible things that people say to them through their lives, it's awful. So I wish that's what they had to worry about. I wish that parents of trans kids, they just only had to worry about, will my, will my child do well in their next school play, their next performance that they're gonna do of a musical instrument? I wish that was the things that they have to worry about, but it's not. And today we're gonna take a step forward as Minnesotans uh, in the right direction. Uh, to help out all of those parents and all of those kids. So our country has always been a place where the oppressed have, seek, have come to seek refuge. And we're not that country anymore. In a lot of states we are seeing, we're becoming oppressors. As a matter of fact, in my community, there is a group that helps transgender people find a way out of the United States to go to another country that is more welcoming. And I'm, I'm deeply troubled by that. And I think today is a day uh, that Minnesota can take a step forward and we can say, we can be that North Star today. We can be that place that you know that you can come to and you can be absolutely welcome. So I'm so happy to be able to vote yes today for that because what we are seeing in other states is certainly not uh, what Minnesota wants to be. And as a matter of fact, our neighbor to the west yesterday passed a few laws that I just want you to know, being on a bordered community, we're open to you. Come to Minnesota. We will love you. As a matter of fact, my representative over in the other body says, lead with love. And today we're going to take a step as Minnesotans to lead with love. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the main reasons I decided to run for office was because of the threat to civil rights that I saw happening across this country. And most significantly, the hateful rhetoric and the attacks being leveled against those in the LGBTQIA community and those against trans folks. It doesn't sit right with me, that's not okay. And I thought to myself, if I can be a single voice in defense of my friends and neighbors in that community, then it will be time well spent here in the legislature. When I decided to run, I learned that one of the families in my district was run out of town because they have a trans child in their family. That's not okay with me. That's not who we are as Minnesotans. That's not who we should be as human beings. This bill is a good bill. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. This bill aims to make Minnesota a safe harbor for transgender people. This country has seen an attack against transgender people over the past several years. There are bills in other states and other uh, districts and jurisdictions seeking to erase trans folks. These bills are discriminatory, they're hateful, and they're not okay with me. Our bill is significant. Neighboring states to Minnesota have already begun enacting laws that have made accessing medical care more difficult. And that's not okay with me. To my trans friends and neighbors, to those who love someone who's trans, my yes vote on this bill will be for you. And it will reaffirm my commitment to keep Minnesota nice and to keep it a welcoming state for all. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President and members. It is a good afternoon. 
and a good day in Minnesota. I, um, I cared for people who were transitioning when I practiced nursing at the University of Minnesota. Uh, that's a number of years ago. Uh, but it informed my perspective, and I came to this work uh, clear about uh, trans lives and trans people and trans care rooted in that professional experience. But what I have learned since I have been elected, engaging with people, uh, with parents of trans children, with trans people, um, learning about their experiences, the things uh, that they face, uh, the bullying and hatred that comes from community, but more importantly, the exquisite love that I have experienced in getting to know and learning from. Um, the people who today I'm fighting for is profound. It's really profound. It's been my greatest education, and it's why this day is so both emotional and important. And when I think about what's happening across the country now, not the first time, certainly not the last time, but the exceptional politicization of trans lives for political points, and just before anybody objects, I'm not accusing anybody in this chamber of that. But if we follow along and we talk with people who are trans, we know it is the case and it is putting their lives in significant danger. And we already know that trans people are people who suffer higher levels of violence and death because of who they are. And so to make that a political point for me is really unforgivable as a person who believes in a politics of purpose and leading with joy. It's unforgivable that we would use a person's life for politics. And again, I am not accusing anybody here, so please don't object, but it is the case. So it is important to me that we are saying out loud today that Minnesota is different. It is not just a safe harbor, but it is a place where we say by our action that you will be safe here. You'll be safe here. You'll get the care you need here. You can be who you are here, and that you are loved. You matter. I'm going to vote yes. Such a joy today. Thank you for being here. Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator May Quaid. Uh, I'm so proud to co-author this bill. I don't think I got a chance to thank you, Senator Dibble, um, for the bill earlier today. It's just, it's been a really good day for us. Um, and I'm so grateful for uh, especially all of the members of the Queer Caucus in both bodies that have been leading these fights. And uh, look at where we are today. It's happening. We're going to do this in a few moments. Um, I'm so proud of Minnesota today because Minnesota is a place where we know that, especially our trans kids, but all trans people are beautiful. They're perfect as they are. Um, we love you, we cherish you. And I wish that other legislatures across this country shared our values. They don't, but guess what? If you need gender affirming care, and that is life saving care, it's medically necessary care. If you need it, you can come to Minnesota. If you're scared or you're looking for a new place to build your family, we want you here in Minnesota. We want you to take refuge here. And that's what we're doing today when we pass this bill. So to all those folks who are looking for a safe place to be, Minnesota is that place. We love you. We welcome you here. You are always going to be safe here. Members, please vote yes. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. What a day, members. What a day for Minnesota. Thank you, Senator McQuaid, Representative Finke. I am filled with joy. 
Despite some of what has been said here today and what's happening across the country, trans people will continue to exist as they have for a millennia across our world. No matter what some people may believe is science, trans people will continue to exist. Trans people are complex, beautiful, they have flaws and families and friends and full lives because they are human beings. I should not have to stand here and say that. It's a fact and will continue to be regardless of what any of us might believe. There are trans people that work for this body, that work for the other body, for the betterment of the lives of all Minnesotans. If you think that your words on this floor don't matter, or that they might not be heard by people who they will hurt, there are people who work for this chamber who they hurt. But they will continue to do that work to better the lives of Minnesotans because they know who they are and they deserve our respect. Part of our work here is to do our best to protect those that live here from harm. Some states are failing to do that work. And we have seen trans people flee to states where it is safer to simply be who they are. I have an email on my phone right now from a family with a non-binary high schooler who lives in another state. They don't want to leave. They don't want to pull their kid out from school, but they are in fear for their family, for their child. And so they're looking for a safe place to move. They're looking for homes and for a school here in Minnesota. This bill provides the protection that other states are failing to provide. Can any of you imagine having to leave your home because you're being told you are no longer welcome? The work of this bill is to provide protection. But I am proud to vote for it because of the message that it sends. This bill says that you may have had to leave, but you are welcome here. Thank you, members. Please vote green. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Senator May Quaid for bringing this important bill forward today. Um, I want to highlight that one of the reasons that we say trans lives matter is because we're losing too many of our LGBTQ plus people from an increasing mental health crisis. According to the CDC, almost 2% of high school students identify as transgender. 27% feel unsafe at or going to and from school. 35% are bullied at school. 35% attempt suicide. As a teacher myself and a parent of LGBTQ plus kids, I want you to know that if you are listening today, if you watch this later, if you're struggling, a reminder that your, our mental health line is open and ready for you at 988 but I also want to close with something, um, my last statement, when we voted on a very good day to also ban conversion therapy. This is what I say to my students. This is what I say to my own children. You are good and perfect the way you are. I will stand up for you. I will protect you with everything I have. You matter. Your voice matters. Your happiness matters. You deserve to be here. There is nothing wrong with you, and you belong here. Members, please vote green. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. I have great compassion um, for anyone who is struggling with their identity, particularly children. My faith instructs me that everyone is a child of God and should be treated as such. 
and that means to be treated with dignity and love. I worry that this bill could harm children and infringe on parents' rights. Today, we have seen Democrats bring forward divisive legislation. This legislation, as we've discussed, has serious constitutional questions around effectively nullifying laws and orders in other states. It also could allow non-Minnesotans to pursue permanent physical changes in the bodies of minor children, even if they don't have custody of those children. Mr. President and members, that is truly unprecedented here in the state of Minnesota in our laws, and I believe it could be dangerous. For those reasons, Mr. President and members, I'll be voting no today. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a truth that each and every one of us is created in the image of God. And as such, everybody is precious. Every life is precious. There is a responsibility to act in love, to act in compassion, and to act with care. This bill brings me great concern. The language in here says, to affirm. As we've discussed today in multiple amendments, Confusion is real. There are good people that unfortunately are suffering with confusion. Identity confusion, gender confusion. It is not the best response to affirm the potential confusion Instead, it is the ultimate act of love. It is the ultimate act of care. It is the ultimate act of compassion to affirm the truth. Whatever that truth might be, in response to a situation of somebody that is suffering with confusion. And I think we can learn from the best example that I can think of as the ultimate act of love and compassion. From a story from the pages of truth itself. When the Creator Himself met a woman by the well, He was gentle with her, He was compassionate with her, he was loving towards her. But he expressed and stood and affirmed the truth with love. Not affirming the confusion, not affirming something that would ultimately be unhealthy. What we need to do is learn from the lessons of our Creator and act in a similar, loving, compassionate way by responding and upholding the truth. This bill infringes on parental rights. It infringes and violates constitutionality, as we've heard, it is not good for the state of Minnesota. It is divisive, it is unhealthy, and it is something we should not be endorsing or supporting here in Minnesota. And because of that, I will be voting no, Mr. President, and I encourage all members to vote no. Thank you. Senator Matthews.
Thank you, Mr. President. I too have something that I want to share to all the children of Minnesota. And yes, that includes our trans children in Minnesota as well. And that is that God says to you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'm gonna go even one better. He also said that before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And thousands of years before any of you even came into existence on this earth, he loved you and he died for you to try to redeem you to himself. There is no one in this chamber here today, Mr. President, that is wishing harm on anyone in the state of Minnesota. We've had a very good and robust discussion, and there are differences in how we read and interpret the policies that are contained here, but there is no one here wishing harm on any of our fellow Minnesotans. The problems in this bill relate to its serious constitutional concerns and its infringements on children, on families, on parental rights. And these have been pointed out, thoroughly debated, and still remain in this bill. All of the sections that we've discussed about are in here that this bill is changing in 260C and in 518D and the other sections that we have been discussing. This bill has in it some of the same risks of harms that have been pointed to in other states as why we're bringing this here today. This is bringing potential for the state to intervene in homes intervene in families, violate parental rights, and cause circumstances that will end up doing harm. That's not what any of us here in this chamber want to have happen, Mr. President. So I hope we can continue working on this and we figure out a way that avoids these constitutional concerns and these parental right concerns. I cannot support this bill today, but I urge all of our members to keep being respectful, to keep showing love, and to realize the truth of what God says to you, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you, Senator uh, May Quaid, for leading on this issue with such courage uh, and, and dignity and purpose uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, what a wonderful day in the state of Minnesota, and history will look so kindly on us as the clouds of bigotry and persecution are gathering in our country that we have created a safe place uh, for people who are the subject of that bigotry. Um, Mr. President, uh, call-outs are not perhaps in order on the floor, but I'm gonna do one call out to my third child, Emily. Emily, I'm proud of your journey today. Grandma is proud of you. <laughs> and we love you. Senator Kunish. Well, members, we have had a very robust discussion here. Um, and I guess, uh, one message that I would like to begin with is how important it is that we listen. We listen not just to each other, but we listen to the children and the community and the parents and our, our, our fellow legislators. Um, I'm so proud to see our House members over here lined up in support knowing what they've already gone through and what many of them have to do every single day. And I think it's so important that every day that we come here to this state legislature that we are listening. 
that we are listening because if we don't, our tongues are going to keep us deaf. And I feel that the words and the stories that so many of us have heard, that the emails that we have received are falling on deaf ears. And because of that, we have had to create a state, a state of sanctuary for our children, for our cousins, for our uncles and our aunts and our grandparents, our brothers and our sisters. And you have to stop and wonder, what kind of a world, what kind of a nation are we sitting in, are we living in, where we have to create that North Star so that our children and our members can live the life that they, that they prefer to live, that they can love the people that they love, that they don't have to hide who they are or be afraid to talk about the things that matter most to them. This bill that, that Senator May Quaid has brought forward shouldn't have to happen. We shouldn't have to have laws where we make a sacred, special place for a certain group of our community members. I often carry legislation for, around Native American issues and speak to those issues. And in the culture of my ancestors, our two-spirit people were looked upon with value. They were recognized as spiritual, unique, blessed people. And that has changed. That has changed when Europeans came and decided that that was offensive, that it didn't fit into their Christian dogma. And all of a sudden, they had to adjust. They had to assimilate in a way that was unnatural to our two-spirit folks. And so the dichotomy of this, you, you can't be the person that you are, is the wrong mantra to be having here. Because every single one of us should be able to be the person that we are. Not looking at our orientation of any sort, but what is in our heart? What is in our soul? What is in our spirit? How do we treat each other? Are we following the golden rule? Treat each other the way we want to be treated. That's what I learned in my Christian faith. And that's what I bring here today. And so I want you all to think about that. So listen. Listen to the heart and the soul of the people that we have had to create a sanctuary for. Because if we don't, we're going to stay deaf. But fortunately, we're not. We have so many people willing to stand up and speak to that. And members, so today I ask you to follow your heart and your soul and vote green for this bill. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Westland and I both belong to the same synagogue. It's called Shir Tikva, and it means Song of Hope. And we believe in practicing radical hospitality, which means we're an open and inclusive community. And trans young people have flocked to us, hungry for a religious community that supports them. And we've been proud to offer a safe refuge, a safe home for these amazing individuals. So I stand today to say I'm also proud to support the Trans Refuge Bill. Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we've heard a lot this last year, maybe the last couple years, about people fleeing Minnesota. People fleeing Minnesota. 
because of our business climate and some other reasons. Um, I can't thank the three authors today enough, Senator Dibble, Senator Morrison, Senator May Quaid. I think today you've reversed that trend, if there ever was such a trend to speak of. 200 years ago, thank you for planting this epiphany in my head today, Senator Kupek. 200 years ago, runaway slaves sought out the North Star, seeking freedom. That's how they found freedom, following the North Star. Today, Senator Kupek earlier talked about the North Star. And I think today, people throughout the country, th certainly throughout the Midwest, tr our transgender population, our gay and lesbian population, and our female populations are all going to be seeking the same thing those runaway slaves sought 200 years ago, a little piece of something they couldn't get where they came from. And I can't thank the three authors enough for making me feel so good about that today. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Latz. Mr. President, members, I too stand today proud to be a member of the State Senate. I will proudly cast my ballot in favor of this bill. Uh, this will be a great step forward in being a welcoming and affirming state. Uh, this will not be the end of the line. There is more we have to do. Uh, once this becomes law, it will take all of us together to implement the law in a way that works that in fact does protect the rights of those in our community who need uh, this assistance. One of the steps we'll be taking in mo on Monday in the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee is amending the state's Human Rights Act to add gender identity as a protected class. Um, it's a little bit that we can do in addition to what the major changes we're doing here today to make affirmation, equality, and safety a reality for all Minnesotans. Thank you. The last two speakers that I'm going to recognize will be Senator Dibble and then the author of the bill. Is there someone else? Senator Pa. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get your attention sooner. I apologize. Thank you for recognizing me to speak. Uh, I just wanted to thank Senator May Quay for this bill and truly for fighting so hard for our trans folks and our neighbors and our friends and our families. I want to thank Senator Murphy for your heartfelt speech because I could not have said it more beautifully. I just want to add one more thing to that and that is to our transgender friends. You are loved, you are seen, and we've heard you today, we stand with you, and we will always continue to, continue to fight with and for you. And with this vote, I hope that it will bring just a little bit more protection and safety to our transgender friends. But I know that the fight ahead of us is still gonna be there but I want all of our friends and our neighbors to know that we will never leave your side and we will always continue to fight with you. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, I think there should be a new Senate rule that uh, every speech has started with a dad joke. <laughs> Why, uh, why wouldn't the skeleton cross the road? Had no guts. <laughs> Sorry, I got a bunch of them. I could go all day. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, I just want to start uh, by saying, uh, I'm really proud to serve with Senator May Quaid and Senator Umu Verbaten. It's really nice to have friends in this chamber. And I'm really happy to see the Queer Caucus standing over on the wall from the House and all the uh, staff we have who are allies, many of whom themselves are queer, um, it's great. It's really great, and it feels really, really good. It's been a long time coming, so welcome. So happy you're here. 
Um, <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, of course I feel proud and happy to be a Minnesotan. I love this state more than I can express. 2013 when we passed that amazing marriage bill and after having defeated such a divisive anti-marriage amendment the year before, we learned, of course, that the things that unite this state are so much stronger and so much more important than those things that divide us. And I knew I loved this state, but I really knew I loved this state then. Um, I had the incredible pleasure of being the grandson of a, my grandmother, um, who was an American patriot, the likes of which you'll never, uh, never understand. I, I wear my flag pin uh, in tribute to her. She wore a flag pin every single day, but she was more a Minnesota patriot than even, maybe even a, an American patriot. Um, but that's not true. Uh, things that are true in Minnesota aren't true in every other state, and that's what brings us this bill here today. Um, and I just want to spend a moment uh, talking about what's happening. You know, I came of age in the late 90s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, when my community was under unrelenting attack in the face of confronting an unbelievable pandemic. Thousands of us were dying and we were being blamed and ridiculed for it. Uh, it was bad. Uh, and we persevered and we thrived and we prospered and we prevailed through that. And the time we're living in is as bad as that. I can only imagine what this world feels like to the teenagers and younger, to those in their early 20s. It is unrelenting, hundreds, remember, hundreds of bills being introduced in other states that would effectively cut us off entirely from information about ourselves, books are being banned, librarians are being sanctioned, if they provide a helpful hand. We heard so much high and mighty speeches today on the House floor about trusted adults. These bills would cut these young people off from even speaking with trusted adults. Being prohibited from just existing in public spaces as who we are, as who they are. Going to the bathroom being who they are in their school, participating in youth development activities, extracurricular activities, sporting events, cut off entirely. Unable to have just simple conversations in classrooms, unable to be referred to by the gender that they are. Illegal, a crime. And most shocking, having the official instrumentalities, the organs, the uh, investigatory power of the state investigating families, reporting families. I saw a website last night in Missouri for people to enter transgender concerns. I saw that. It was not a hoax. State of Missouri. Anyone can go on and register a transgender concern, whatever that is. Children being taken away from their parents. We saw the language moving through Florida. Mr. President, members, what is someone left to conclude other than there is a systematic push to deny the humanity, the essential humanity of people, of our children, to question our very existence, to erase them? That is what's happening in this country today. I mean, I don't even read all of the news. It's just more bad news after more bad. It's like living under the previous administration where I just try to ignore the news on a daily basis because it's, it's overwhelming and it's dis dispiriting. And the language that is used by the proponents and the advocates is language we've heard today on the Senate floor. Grooming, mutilation, gender confusion. I'm going to use I language now because I do not want to cast dispersions or question motives. So when I hear words like grooming, mutilation, and gender confusing, to me, I feel disparaged. I feel demeaned. 
I feel like it has the effect of vilifying me and a whole entire community to which I belong and vilifying those who would love and support us. It feels to me like a slur, it's pejorative, it creates division and misunderstanding and fear and results in acts and policies of discrimination. So we have an opportunity to do and say and be something different. The Minnesota we know and love, the Minnesota we knew to be true in 2012 and 2013, because people are already coming here. We heard the story on public radio this morning about the family in Duluth who fled their state because they're refugees in our own country coming to Minnesota, the North Star. And we can say those awful laws that are being enacted do not reach into the state. We have to do that because we're Minnesota. And I'll just conclude with this, Mr. President. If you have any doubt and you suffer under the illusion that uh, these young people have gender confusion, I assure you that's not the case. It's gender clarity. Watching right now um, is the Edwards family, Hannah Edwards, Dave Edwards, and their incredible daughter, Hildy, and her sister, Dahlia, is probably watching as well. And Hannah is the executive director of Transforming Families. I went to their picnic last year down on the Mississippi River. Dozens and dozens of family, hundreds of people. Please, members, those of you who are gonna vote no today, please attend that picnic. See these beautiful families, these exuberant, beautiful children. It will become clear to you the beauty, the goodness, the love, the community. There's no confusion. You will have no doubt. So thank you again, Senator McQuaid, uh, for the great honor of bringing this bill. You've done an incredible job. I'm proud to serve with you. I'm proud to vote yes today. Thank you, members. Last voice we will hear is from the author of House File 146, Senator Makeweight. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I just found the downside of being the last speaker on your own bill. First, I want to thank the co-authors of this bill, Senator Dibble, Senator Umar Baton. We three make up the caucus, the queer caucus in the Senate, Senator Port, Senator McEwen, I want to thank everybody from the other body who has come here in support, especially the members of the Queer Caucus there. Minnesota was the first state to protect trans people in our human rights law. It's in a weird place. It's in the wrong place. We're going to fix that on Monday. But we were the first state. It is good that we continue our legacy of inclusion today. Minnesota decided a long time ago that discrimination and hate was wrong, today we continue in our steps forward in inclusion and welcoming, becoming a sanctuary, a beautiful word. I've never heard something more beautifully described. Minnesota is a sanctuary. We are an island, a beacon of care and compassion and personal freedom, where people get to make their own healthcare decisions with their doctors, not the members of this chamber. That's beautiful. Senator Dibble brought up um, Hannah Edwards, the executive director of Transforming Families. And when we stand in this room and when we talk about policy, so often the people who are impacted become this like academic theoretical debate. And she sent me little snippets of parents of trans kids and why they're proud of their kids. And those kids deserve to hear that today. Natalie, your parents are so proud that you came out and that you train educators and support other trans youth. AJ. You sat on a panel against banning books. Aiden, you shined on the stage this year, and apparently you're learning how to drive. Wear your seatbelt. Quentin, you are such a creative kid, and you're very kind and a great older sibling. Avery, your mom thinks you are the bravest, kindest girl she knows. Parker, you started a new school after having foot surgery. I hope it's healing OK. Your parents are so proud of you for rocking school this year. Asher. You are working two jobs while you're getting ready to graduate and move out. You are living your best life and crushing all the obstacles in the way. Lena, your parents sat in the cold rain for a few hours last night watching your varsity ultimate frisbee game, but they're not mad because they love you so much and you're the captain. So they're very, very proud of you for being such a confident role model. Cam, 
you are the trailblazer who was the first elementary school kid to come out, excuse me, openly transition in St. Cloud schools. And when friends at school asked why, you said, oh, it was just a mistake, we cleared it up now, and your confidence in who you are has inspired others to be their true selves. Andrea, you make your mom the proudest parent. You came out eight years ago, and she has never been prouder to be your mom. Dakota, you make your parents so proud performing a ukulele vocal solo in front of 200 people. That's a lot of people. Kit, you rescued a great Dane Mastiff, and he turns two this week. Congratulations. Lee, every day your parents marvel at how comfortable you are in your own skin. Toby, your parents are proud that you're able to find your voice and defend who you are. Jamie, you got a really cool homecoming outfit, and it was really fun shopping with you. The sets you create for your high school musical plays are amazing. Jack was recognized by his third grade class for being the most considerate kid, and it was the first time the vote was unanimous. Harry, you give the best hugs. M, you've known who you are since you were six, and your mom is so proud of you. Kai, you literally take on any challenge, you bring good sportsmanship, and you've helped your friends with math and Spanish. Natalie, you're doing PSEO, and your parents are so excited to see what happens when you graduate. And Koa, you have modeled what it means to be your authentic self and showing your church community another example of what growing into the full stature of Christ can look like. These, these are the kids. They know who they are. Their parents know who they are. This bill is to make sure that the ignorant, hateful things that other states do to trans kids do not come here. Because those kids are. Because those families are. And we welcome them. And we want them to know that it is not a question, no question, whether they are protected and cherished and beloved in this state. I've had a different vibe today, Mr. President, for a few reasons. I was the first black mom elected to this chamber. You have a black mom. You know you don't mess with black moms. All kids, all these kids today were my kids. My kid is in the hospital right now at Children's. I didn't sleep last night because I was just holding her. And so I'm tired today, but I left her with her mama to come here and fight for everyone else's kid because they're my kids today. And I am so proud to do that work. This bill protects those parents, it protects those kids, and it protects those providers because the increasing threat for providing medical care that is appropriate and evidence-based, peer-reviewed, studied, is increasingly putting doctors in threat of jail. And that is not okay. Not in Minnesota. After today, not in Minnesota. Mr. President, I'll end with this. I remember when I learned about the Little Rock Nine. I went home and I asked my dad, who grew up during the Civil Rights era, if he remembered the Little Rock Nine. And he said, yeah, he remembered. He remembered seeing the picture on, on the front of the newspaper. And I said, do you think that those people who were yelling at those black students walking in, I mean, you could see the vitriol on their face. You could see that they were yelling horrible things. Do you think they knew that they were the villains of history? And he said, I don't know. I hope they do now. Members, we have an opportunity today to be heroes of history. Because when they write stories, books about this era, they will write about what's happening in this country. And it is surreal, it is surreal to be in real time knowing exactly who the villains of history are going to be because they're the villains of right now. And in this chamber today, we have the opportunity to put up a green vote and say we stood up to those bullies. We made Minnesota a great place to live for every kid, especially trans kids. We said no to that. And so members, I encourage all of you to vote green. I've heard a lot of people doing it, but I wanna encourage everyone to vote green because I can promise you there will be a child, my child maybe, who will ask me, mom, do you think the people who hated on those trans kids knew what they were doing? And I do, I do think you know. 
I do think they know, Mr. President. And today is our opportunity to do it different. And I'm so honored to have carried this legislation forward to give a modicum of hope and love and support to those families. And I ask for everyone's green vote with me. Thank you. Members, as a gentle reminder, and before we get ready to take the vote, that we cannot have any out outbursts in the chambers or in the gallery. And that's a gentle, loving reminder. And I just want you to know that. Uh, no matter which way the vote goes. Uh, Senator Pappas. Um, Mr. President, um, would you give the chamber and the gallery permission to celebrate after we adjourn? After we adjourn, you can celebrate, but not before Thank you. we adjourn. I want to make sure that everyone understands that after we adjourn does not mean in anticipation of us adjourning. It means after we adjourn. Now that we have the housekeeping clear, the secretary will take the role on final passage of House File 146. Senator Friends, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Dedzik votes aye. And remember, uh, members, while we're voting, you're not supposed to be talking to each other. Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Hoschild votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Muhammad votes aye. Senator Muhammad votes aye. And Senator Rest votes aye. And Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Pratt votes no. Senator Western votes no. Senator Western votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Weber votes no. And Senator Weber votes no. All senators having a, a desire to vote has voted. The secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 30 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Members, we'll now go to the 13th order of business. 13th order of business is announcement of Senate interests. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Coleman, Dreheim, Housley all day, Nelson all day, Westrum, 11.10 to 12.30 p.m., and Pratt, 11.10 to 12.30 p.m. Any, uh, any announcements? Any additional announcements? Mr. President. Oh, Senator uh, Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Say, before we move out from today, we, we do have a special, uh, special day uh, here on the floor today, too, as well. Uh, it's our Sergeant Randy LaFoy's birthday today, so if you see him, wish him a happy birthday when you get a chance. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Seeing none, Senator Kunish. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, April 24th at 11 a.m. Any discussion? On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The Senate is now adjourned. <laughs>